Good, well, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee 17th meeting of 2019. There are no apologies. The agenda item one is the decision on whether to take item five in private, which is the review of the evidence we hear today. Are we agreed? We agreed. Uh, we also have to decide whether our consideration of draft reports on the presumption against short periods of imprisonment, Scotland Order 2019, and the impact of Brexit on criminal and civil justice and policing should be taken in private at future meetings. Are we agreed? Agreed. Good. Agenda item two is a continuation of our scrutiny of proposals to change the time period for the presumption against short sentences. And I'm pleased to welcome the Cabinet Secretary and his officials today, um, David Doris, Head of Community Justice uh, Interventions Unit, Peter Konglong, Head of Justice Analytical Unit, and Isabel Joyner, Director of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. I refer um, members to paper one which is a public paper and paper two which is a private paper and um, I believe you wish to make a, a short uh, opening statement of up to two minutes cabinet secretary okay I'll speak quickly thank you uh, convener for that uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak to this uh, we're seeking parliamentary approval to extend the presumption uh, now that additional safeguards to protect victims in the Domestic Abuse Act are in force as committed to in our programme for government. Uh, the presumption is not a ban. Uh, we're not abolishing sentences of under 12 months, uh, and the judiciary will continue to be able to impose a custodial sentence where alternatives are not appropriate. Uh, extending the presumption, of course, is not a silver bullet. It must be seen as part of a broader evidence-led preventative approach. Uh, the evidence that short periods of imprisonment don't work is clear. They disrupt all things that are most likely to help reduce offending, uh, family relationships, housing, employment, access to health care and support. Uh, people released from short custodial sentences of 12 months or under are reconvicted nearly twice as often as people who have received a community payback order. We've all heard community sentences being described as quote unquote soft justice, uh, which is both misleading uh, and damaging. In its written evidence to this committee, the Scottish Sentencing Council stated that in its view, and I quote, community sentences are not a soft option, as is sometimes suggested. A recent Council of Europe report found that Scotland has, uh, has uh, the highest correctional, sorry, the third highest correctional rate across Europe, uh, with 548 people per 100,000. And we currently have, as committee members will know, the highest imprisonment rate in Western Europe, with 150 per 100,000 of the population incarcerated. These are not statistics to be proud of. Uh, and despite the fact that we have taken bold action, which has helped to cut crime by around a third of the last decade, <coughs> a dry, and, and drive down reconviction rates to uh, a 19-year low, uh, we need to get away from the view that justice is either hard uh, or soft. It needs to be proportionate. Justice needs to be fair. Uh, and above all, it needs to be smart and evidence-led. It needs to be tailored to the individual, while, of course, ensuring the safety of victims. It needs to provide the opportunity for rehabilitation, while ensuring that those uh, whose offending has harmed the community pay back for their crimes. Uh, we need to have community sentences that sentences, offenders, communities and victims have confidence in. That's why we invested an additional 9.5 million per year on community justice services, which brings investment in community justice social work to over 100 million pounds. Uh, it's clear uh, from the evidence that committee has taken that the strong support for extending this presumption um, provided uh, community-based interventions are appropriate, resourced uh, and indeed uh, effective. Uh, during the committee's evidence session, I know that the issue of remand has often also been raised. Uh, recognising that the impact of remand can be similar to short custodial sentences. Uh, prisoners on remand make up around 20% of the prison population at any given time, uh, indeed 25% of women, uh, and the number of people held on remand is at its highest level for five, over five years. Uh, I know your inquiry last year into use of remand in Scotland made a number of recommendations uh, and observed that in some of the cases, the conversion rate of remand to custodial sentence was relatively low. Uh, in responding to the report last year uh, and delivering our programme for government commitments on bail supervision, guidance and funding, uh, we have taken action. However, we're open to consider uh, on a cross-party basis further options that can help to respond to the high proportion uh, of prisoners held uh, in remand. Um, uh, I hope this is helpful. I'm, of course, happy to now answer any questions on the proposed extension. 
Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can we perhaps open by asking you what evidence there is on the impact of the current presumption of sentencing? Uh, well, there is uh, numerous uh, pieces of, of ed evidence, numerous articles written, numerous academics that have researched the impact of short custodial sentences versus uh, the rehabilitative effect of, of community sentencing, uh, and all of them are, are, are unequivocal uh, that uh, short sentences are more disruptive. Short sentences are uh, not as likely to help the rehabilitation journey as community sentences. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, if you want an independent view of this, the, the, the independent UK-based Crest advisory report on the impact of PASS uh, endorsed the rationale for the presumption it stated, and, and again I'll quote, given reconviction rates are particularly high for shorter custodial sentences compared to longer lengths, the reduction in reconviction rates correlate with the decrease in the use of short custodial sentences. Uh, as would be uh, expected. Uh, we know from the figures uh, that, that are available that uh, those uh, who have a short custodial sentences, sentence uh, are reconvicted nearly twice as often uh, as those in a community payback order. So the evidence, uh, I have to say, Kavira, is, is absolutely uh, overwhelming uh, for, for this progressive reform. Well, you'll be aware, Cabinet Secretary, we took extensive evidence last week um, included the, the use, the fact that the use of these sentences was falling prior to the introduction of the pre presumption. Um, it seems fair that the current presumption has not had a significant impact on sentencing. That's something that um, would seem to follow from that. In addition to that, um, Professor Tata, and it's uh, something else you've reiterated today, uh, questioned the presumption against sentences of three months and the use of CPOs and their introduction in 2011 have alongside other reformed helped achieve a 19-year low in reconviction rates. He says that um, that really is, is an assertion that um, doesn't stand the, uh, the scrutiny, um, given that there's a mention about reconviction and so many other um, direct measures have been put into these criminal reconvictions, which would impact rather than relating it uh, specifically to the presumption against three month sentence. I mean, uh, with the greatest uh, of, of respect, um, uh, it would be incredible if you were able to find a piece of evidence that showed to the contrary that um, short sentences do not have the rehabilitative uh, impact that community sentences do. So you're absolutely right. We can argue about some of the nuances about whether uh, past and the, the current presumption uh, as it exists, what the impact of that has been. Uh, there, there are some issues around control factors. I accept that, that of course, those that uh, would be more likely to get a custodial sentence versus a community payback order, perhaps the seriousness of their offence. Uh, the, 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 there's, a, there's a degree of, of, of difference in that. Yes, we can argue about the nuances for sure. But if you take a, if, if you just let me finish this point, if you take a step back, and look at the issue that we're, we're, we're discussing here, the evidence is absolutely unequivocal. And that is why you have criminologist after academic after academic saying that they support the presumption against short sentences because when it comes to rehabilitation, there is absolutely no doubt that community sentences addressing the root causes the root problems, the reasons why people offend, much more effective for rehabilitation uh, than, than, than short custodial sentences. Can I be quite clear? Are you saying that um, the presumption against a three-month sentence is a direct consequence of um, or has achieved the 19-year low in um, reconviction rates? I'm certainly saying I'm sure it's a part of it. I don't doubt that for a minute, just to give you the numbers. But, I mean, it, the impact might be, all be moderate, but um, I'm hoping that even a moderate impact, of course, will have a, a, an impact and a significant impact on anybody who might be a future, uh, no longer be a future victim uh, of crime. Uh, for example, the proportion of individuals receiving a custodial sentence of three months or less has fallen from 35% in 2010-11 to 27% uh, in 2017-18. So that's around 3,000 
200 individuals. So while that is moderate, that's 3,200 individuals, which hopefully uh, will be better placed in terms of their, their journey uh, of rehabilitation. And hopefully that means, of course, less victims of crime. So, no, I, I'm not asserting that uh, the 19-year loan reconviction is simply because uh, of that one measure. I think in my opening remark, I made the point that uh, what we're presenting is not a silver bullet, uh, but, but, but one important measure in a broader package of justice reform. I think um, the point really that was made last week is there is no evidence, there is a, a direct co correlation between the two, uh, not least because the term conviction was used and, the, and because of the enormous growth in direct measures, um, such as um, the core offers of a settlement, fiscal fines, um, alternatives, um, which were uh, absolutely impacting on the drop in conviction rates. However, I'll bring others in. You've answered that, Cabinet Secretary. Supplementary. Supplementary, Shona, then Daniel. Uh, thanks. Just on the point of, of the evidence, and you mentioned academics and uh, criminologists. Um, what about um, politicians, ministers from elsewhere, UK government? Have they shown any interest in the evidence of three months' sentences? Very Something much so. Again, I mean, it's, so uh, as I say, the, the evidence is overwhelming. We can, we can dance on the pin uh, of uh, the head of a pin uh, if we wish to, to talk about specific nuances, and, and fair enough. But the evidence is absolutely overwhelming that short sentences simply do not work and community alternatives are much more effective. And yes, the, the UK government, and I've made this point on, on numerous occasions, be it on social media or others, uh, the UK government, of course, has often lauded Scotland, looking towards Scotland in terms of what we are doing. The up here, in fact, one of the, the Conservative leadership candidates, I don't know where he is on the pecking order, but Rory Stewart himself is, I don't know if he has the backing of any of the Conservative members up here in Scotland, but certainly Rory Stewart has come to Scotland uh, himself to, to learn more about our, our approach to the presumption against short sentences. David Gock, somebody who uh, I have a lot of uh, time for uh, in, in, in UK government as, as, as the Secretary of State uh, for Justice, he himself has quoted um, specifically that we need to move away from the labels of, of, of hard and soft justice and look towards smart justice. And of course, the UK government are bringing in not a presumption, but going further, I would say, to some extent, and bringing forward a ban uh, on, on short sentences uh, of six months uh, or less, um, you know, he said, and I'll quote David Gawk, David Gawk, sorry, uh, directly, I want a smarter justice system that reduces repeat crime prov by providing robust community alternatives to ineffective short prison sentences, supporting offenders to turn away from crime for good. So um, even um, those who, who, who are traditionally more conservative and, and, and perhaps uh, not ones that you would associate with progressive justice reform, even they uh, can see that short sentences are simply not effective in dealing with the root causes of why people offend. Daniel? So, uh, again, focusing on the, the evidence, Cabinet Secretary, since 2003, we've seen approximately a halving of the number of uh, sentences of up to three months being handed out. But over the same time period, We've seen sentences of over one in, uh, uh, of between one and two years double, and indeed we've also seen sentences of over two years rise by approximately a, a third. Now it's not a perfect displacement, but nonetheless, one inference from that is that, that there has perhaps <laughs> been up tariffing. I'm, I'm wondering if if you'd agree whether that is evidence of that, but more importantly. What, what steps or measures will you take to make sure that that isn't an outcome of the presumption against 12 sentences, of essentially sentences just increasing the tariff to put it over that threshold? Uh, I think it's a really important point, and, and I thank Daniel Johnson for, for, for making it. I hope that I can give you a couple of reassurances. One of the reasons why we went for 12 months as opposed to any other time frame, of course, is that that fits into somebody proceedings and, 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 and the, the, the sentence that can be opposed, uh, imposed, I should say, the maximum sentence that can be imposed for somebody proceeding. So there couldn't be an up-tariffing necessarily uh, in, in that respect. That was to avoid that because you're right, that is one inference that can be taken from the current presumption as it stands. Uh, and so we want to avoid that being the case. So that's why we've gone for one of the reasons excuse me, why we've gone for 12 months, is to prevent that up-tariffing. The broader issue that Daniel Johnson mentions uh, is also a very important one, I think it's one that you took evidence on. Um, we have to ensure that the judiciary has confidence 
in the community justice landscape. Uh, and there's clearly some evidence that in some loca localities, in some areas, um, uh, the, the, the sheriffs uh, need that confidence and need to be persuaded uh, about the merits of, of community-based alternatives and the robustness of them in the lo locale. Um, so that's obviously got to be a part of the work that we do. So, so this extension of this presumption, hopefully if it passes uh, through committee, uh, there is still a lot of work uh, that we are doing and actively engaging in, uh, and judicial confidence is absolutely a part of that. Liam Kerr, then Fulton. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just by way of clarification, I think David Gork mentioned that he wanted to learn from the mistakes that have been made up here, such as CPOs not being enforced. And I think the Convener's point, Cabinet Secretary, uh, I, I take your point about the effectiveness of three-month sentences, but uh, what this committee heard last week was that there was shockingly poor data on the effectiveness of community sentences. And I think that's an important nuance to pick up. But uh, my question is just a very simple one, actually. You talked about the, the fewer three-month sentences coming about. Uh, are you able to help the committee understand what, what does your modelling suggest? When, uh, if you get this presumption against 12-month sentences, in, what does the modelling suggest will be the outcome? How many fewer criminals will go to prison and instead will go into the CPO system? Well, can I take exception from what he says uh, about what David Gawk has said? I mean, I, I quoted directly, um, and I'll quote again directly, from David Gawk just from this month on, on, on the 4th of June. He was answering questions in the chamber in response to Joanna Cherry MP said, and again, I will quote, um, I hope to be able to say more about the details of what we want to do in the not too distant future. But in respect of the approach that's been taken in Scotland, it's worth bearing in mind that it's already the case in England that a custodial sentence should be pursue, pursued as a last resort. So this is already something, uh, there's already something approaching a presumption in the English system. I'm interested in seeing whether we could go further than that, but I welcome the Honourable and Learned Lady's approach, our shared approach, I think, um, of scepticism about the effectiveness uh, of, of, of short, sentence, short sentences. Now, Rory Stewart, when he came up here, when he was in his previous position as prison minister, didn't come up here uh, to, 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 to berate the Scottish government or berate the Scottish experience. He came to learn from the Scottish experience. Uh, so I think that's is, is important. In terms of, of, of the modelling uh, and, and the figures and the numbers and, and, and the stats that we have in front of us, uh, of course, it's difficult to forecast because judges ultimately are the ones that will have the decision to make about the presumption or not. That is a presumption. Uh, what we can do is base it uh, on, on, on uh, the, the current presumption uh, as it exists, but even that is, is, is riddled uh, with, with, with difficulty. So it will be very much uh, up to the judiciary. I will bring in Peter, if you don't mind, he's the independent expert in terms of the, 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 the stats, um, who works for Just Analytical uh, Services. Um, in terms of, of completion rates, because he touched upon this, uh, of, of, of CPOs. Can I just make a, a point to, uh, you know, the, the less than a third who do not complete, his inference is correct. The government has to work hard to try to increase those completion rates. I, I absolutely accept that. We have done that. They've increased uh, from 64% to 70% uh, in, in the last decade. But of course, we have to, to, to go further. But I do ask the member genuinely what he thinks the alternative is. Because if the alternative is continuing to give people short sentences, then I don't know if he knows, but the numbers... Uh, the, the, given a short sentence, 35% of those given a short sentence end up back in custody. That's a pretty serious offence they must have committed to end up back in custody. For the less than a third that don't complete a CPO, OK, they may not have attended their CPO. That's serious, of course, and they'll be dealt with. But is it really as serious as the over 35% that end up back in jail? I don't think the alternative uh, is, 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 is much better at all, in fact, much worse. Uh, in terms of the, the numbers around the stats and the modelling, I'll, I'll bring in Peter and he may be able to, to give a little bit more detail on that. Um, as you've already heard, there was a reduction in the use of three-month sentences before the presumption came in, so it's quite difficult to work out exactly what specific impact the three-month presumption might have made. So there's a limit to how much we can extrapolate from that to a 12-month presumption. Um, what we have done, though, is presented a few scenarios to help people plan. One of those scenarios was based on a fairly optimistic, I guess, assumption that we might have a 20% reduction in the use of sentences between three and 12 months. And in terms of helping partners plan, that roughly equates to something like a 7.5% increase in the number of community sentences. 
So that sort of balances out the drop that we've seen in the last year. Now, forgive me, could, this is really useful, but could you, um, the people watching percentages, give me some numbers if you can. We're talking about that 7.5% would be about 1,300 additional community sentences. So 1,300 people, if that modelling works, who would have gone to prison but are now going to be on the community sentences? I mean, it would be a decision that would be made in individual circumstances, but if there was a 20% shift in sentencing, then yes, that would be 1,300 additional community sentences. Uh, so that would be 1,300 people with a better chance of rehabilitation than previous... <clears throat> if you deny Professor Tata's data that the... Uh... No, no, I, I think you, you're absolutely incorrect. I mean, I, I've met with Professor Tata and, and I'm happy for you to seek his clarification. But actually, if, you de if, you, if you, you're genuinely, I don't think, denying the fact, and I think it would be really damaging to your, your credibility if you're denying the fact that all the research, almost bar none, shows that community sentences are more effective in rehabilitation than short custodial sentences and if you are denying that I'd be really happy to hear you to say it on the record because you would be isolated uh, beyond your current isolation. Uh, with respect session. Cabinet Secretary I'm simply repeating reflecting back that Professor Tata told this committee there was shockingly poor data. I'm, uh, I'm simply repeating back what the no, evidence no, this okay, committee heard. But tell me I mean in your, in your opinion and I appreciate you, you guys are the ones meant to be asking the questions but I'd be really interested to know whether or not you think that community sentences are not more effective in terms of rehabilitation than short custodial sentences? Because that is the inference I'm taking from what you're saying. And if that is the case, then genuinely you are, as I say, more isolated in this issue than, than anyone else. And that, I think the question is the use and resourcing of current custodial sentences. And I think what <coughs> Professor Dato, uh, Dato was saying is, for one reason or another, by default, people end up in a short-term sentences. And equally, we know they have absolutely no access to any um, rehabilitation services whatsoever. So what do we do? We put the resources into those people who find themselves by default on a short-term sentence. It doesn't happen just now. And even in the three months, that's 12 weeks continuously, day by day, working with someone. As a former teacher, I can tell you, you can do a huge amount during that time to signpost, to sort out issues. If we move to a presumption of 12 months, even more. I so hope that answers the Cabinet Secretary's questions. We must move on. Fulton, a, a supplementary, and then Rona. Thanks, uh, um, Convener. Just a, a very brief one. Cabinet Secretary, I, I agree with the presumption, uh, especially as a first step, but you did mention earlier that the UK Government um, are considering a ban. Did we consider that at any stage in, in coming to the conclusion of a presumption? And if the UK government do or do not go ahead with it, do we need to consider it in the future? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to respond back to convener, and, 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 and I'm afraid I'm going to have to because the evidence from the chief executive of, of, of the prison service was, was right. I mean, prison can't do everything. And, and even if it could, we know, again, going back to the evidence and the data, that community sentences are far more effective in rehabilitation than short custodial sentences. Um, and that is just undeniable. But in terms of the question being asked by, by, by Fulton McGregor, uh, we, we didn't consider a ban. I, I don't think the ban is the right way to go. Um, although, I, as I said, I do have respect for for David Gock as, 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 as Justice uh, Secretary. Um, I think a ban is, is the wrong way uh, because essentially what you do is you have a ban and then a long list of exceptions to that ban. So perhaps exceptions for sexual offences or uh, other offences. Um, uh, and also it very much restricts the judiciary. I think the judiciary are best placed to decide um, who, who, uh, who, who should, be given, who should uh, be given a short custodial sentence and, and who should be diverted away from, from custody. So I think a presumption is, is a much better way to, to go about it. Okay. Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, yes, I'd like to ask you about prisoner numbers. Um, given that we know that, you know, for many people, prisons just simply not effective, and that we are we have the highest imprisonment rate in Western Europe. Um, do you agree with um, some witnesses that said that uh, any reduction in the use of short custodial sentences, resulting from the proposed presumption, would have a limited impact on overall prisoner numbers? And what kind of um, modelling has been done on? 
you know, what that might mean. Yeah, I, mean, I think that is correct, actually. I, I don't think that's... Um that, that, that that's uh, uh, an issue that I would take contention with or a premise that I would take contention with. I think that's that's correct, that um, what we're looking at is, is, is relatively modest, um, you know, based on the projections that Peter talked about previously, the 20% forecast, um, the reduction in the total prison population would probably be in around between two, two to 300. So, yes, that makes an impact, of course, that helps to ease some of the pressure that we've seen uh, in recent months, no doubt about it, but but it is relatively moderate. That is why you know th the reason for doing this is not to to ease the prison population, although that is a welcome side effect. That it is because we think it is the principled, correct, progressive reform to make, so that more people are re rehabilitated and vis-a-vis -vis there's more or uh, th th there's I should say not more there's less victims of crime because of this. That is the hope. Uh, and, and, and that is what the evidence uh, tells us. But there will be a reduction, will be a modest one, we think, in prison population. Uh, I suppose the, the important point, which I was trying to stress yesterday in various uh, interviews that I did, was uh, the, there may well be uh, a, a disproportionate effect in a good way on, on, on the female custodial population, where we know that those that receive a custodial sentence are around about 90% of women uh, receive a custodial sentence of, of a year or less. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's absolutely crucial. Um, so just sort of following on from that argument, um, you, you, you said in your opening statement you'd allocated more, uh, £9.5 million pounds more um, for community justice services. Um, and so do you agree that it follows that the pres pres proposed presumption won't free up resources which might be diverted to other prisoners or community sentences. How much effect is the, you know, is it, what's the financial effect going to be on, on the short sentences? Well, I think it's a really good question in terms of how, how, how you prioritise uh, that, that funding and what the profile of that spend will be in the future. So I think in the short term, it's important that we have done what we've done, which is protect and, 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 and uh, that budget for 1920, that 100 million, more than 100 million for, for criminal justice. Uh, social work, which includes an additional uh, 9.5 uh, million, uh, th that, uh, of which, uh, uh, of course, will, will help local authorities uh, in the alternatives uh, to custody. Um, it's important also to, to recognise that um, number of community payback orders actually has, has reduced by 8.3 nationally. So while we've increased the budget, uh, increased the funding, the Section 27 ring-fenced funding for criminal justice uh, social work by 7.3%. We've had a reduction of CPOs by 8.3%. So th th there's genuine confidence that the system uh, can cope uh, and can manage uh, with, with, with this presumption. We will, of course, listen to each local authority on a, on a kind of case by by case uh, basis. In terms of the broader question around the transfer from kind of SPS, uh, the prison service, to, to social work over time, um, the member will completely understand that in the short term, of course, we need to keep our prisons absolutely running, um, and, and therefore we need to to to, uh, to allocate the the necessary funding uh, for for our prisons. In the long term, I would. Really, and I'm an advocate for this. I'd like to see our prison numbers drastically fall. Uh, I would like to see us, uh, on the preventative side, not sending as many people to prison, but also investing a lot in the rehabilitative measures, uh, so that we have a really dramatic reduction in, in in our prison population. So, therefore, hopefully, if that would happen to 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 quite an extent, not not the numbers that I'm talking about here, but quite a dramatic, significant extent, then of course I can see no reason why in the future we wouldn't reprofile spending from, from prisons into perhaps those alternatives. But that is, I'm um, afraid, um, not the stage that we're, we're currently at. Okay. So would you agree that we are working towards almost a culture change in, in the way we look at prison and the use of prison um, by using more effective methods in the community? Yeah, I mean, I actually think we're in a very unique position uh, in the current prof profile of this parliament, and, and it's important we don't waste it. I mean, with the exception, uh, frankly, of, of the Conservatives, uh, with every other political party, I think there's a, a genuine uh, understanding of the progressive reforms that we have to bring forward uh, in, our, in our punitive policy. Now, that doesn't just involve politicians, it involves the judiciary, 
Uh, of course, it involves third sector, it involves the schools, it involves early intervention, it involves social work, it involves many, many others. Um, but we absolutely, that, that, the use of that word that Rona uh, used, I think was absolutely right. There has to be an absolute culture change, a mindset change in how we approach punitive um, policy. That high prison rate, that highest in, in, in Western Europe imprisonment rate is, is, is a really stain on our conscience. Um, but it's not a quick fix. Um, I've spoken to previous Scottish government and, and, and at that time Scottish executive justice ministers to try to gain their understanding from different political parties uh, and they tell me that the, the issues that I was talking to them about were issues that they were grappling with um, when, when, when they were in position. So we've got to, to, to really try to take parliament with us and, and take the public with us um, on, on, on a radically different journey when it comes to our punitive policy. Thank you. Jenny. <clears throat> On Nora Mackay's point about that culture shift, Cabsec, um, I'd like to go back to some of the evidence we heard from Katrina uh, Morrison last week from the Howard League um, for Scotland. And she said that if Scotland was a, a, an American state, it would have a prison rate uh, comparable with, I think, Louisiana or Texas. Um, and in my line of questioning to her, she said, I struggle with the paradox of why a country that is so committed to social welfare investment makes huge use of such an incredibly expensive resource as prison. So I'd like to get your thoughts on the record, perhaps, as to how we got here. Why do we have such a high in prison rate, do you think? What is that cultural thing we have in Scotland which doesn't exist in other European countries? Um, yes, good question. I've tried to give it brief because you could speak, I'm, I'm sure, to, to quite an extent on, on, on the reasons why. There's not really one reason um, why. Uh, there's a number of factors probably behind the high prison rate. Um, if I was to just give you three, perhaps, uh, one would be judicial behaviour. So we know that the punishment part of a life sentence has dramatically increased over the last decade. Um, I don't know the, the exact figures, but I'm going to give you an approximation from a decade ago. Uh, the punishment part, I looked towards Peter, who will keep me right, but appro approximately 12, 13 years a decade ago to now 18, 19 years is what the punishment part is. So people are in prison for a lot longer. Um, for, for committing the same crime uh, and they were a, a, a decade ago. So that means that there's less churn that people are in. Uh, another reason is, is, is no doubt the nature of the offences coming in front of us. So the, the good thing is that uh, victims of rape and sexual offences uh, and, and, and even victims of, of those historical sexual offences have more confidence to report them, more confidence they've ever had before. That's a good thing. Um, but of course, those offences, by the nature of those offences, will often have a custodial sentence attached to them. So we're seeing more and more people in prison for, for sexual offences, rape, attempted rape and historical sexual offences. And then there's also undoubtedly the effect that the, the, the decisions we choose to make um, have, 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 have an impact. HTC would be one of the most obvious ones. So at one point we had 300 people out in HTC, the review took place. Those changes have now seen the numbers of HTC reduced to between 55 and, and 65. Um, so uh, there, there's, there, there's, there's a belief uh, that perhaps the pendulum has swung too far in the other direction. So again, you're not having that churn of people going out in HTC that previously would have gone out in HTC. So uh, that's just three reasons. There's, there's, there's many more reasons uh, for that, but it all goes back to the fact that there's not one silver bullet uh, and that if we are going to have a radically different approach to our punitive policy, then we have to bring in all the other stakeholders. And I'm working on, on doing some of that. And I have to say some of the conversations with, with, with many people around this table have been effective uh, to, to give me some good ideas on how we do that. Um, but we have to take a, a radically different approach uh, because um, the evidence that you received was absolutely right. Uh, for some reason, this policy, our, our punitive policy, you know, is it somewhat odds to the progressive country that we, 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 we uh, rightly are proud of being? Um, thank you for that. Um, in evidence last week, Dr Tata also told us that you know, prison is still used to this day as some sort of penal welfare um, when nothing else has worked. Um, and I wonder if you would agree with that assertion. You know, we're talking about people here with serious mental health problems. Um, you know, their, their life might have collapsed around about them. There might have been a number of different things that have happened to them. And it gets to this stage in the system whereby there's nowhere else for them to go. So, so prison is a last resort. Do you think that's still the case? Well, I, I don't disagree with, with, with the general premise. Uh, you know, one, one academic described it to me that there's a very wide door into a prison, but a very narrow door out of our prison. So, you know, it's pretty easy to end up 
in jail um, and, 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 and very difficult in some essence to, to get out of jail or to get out of that revolving door that brings you back in and out of jail, where he said we have to turn that on his head, there has to be a narrow door into prison and a very wide door uh, out, uh, out of prison through rehabilitation. I think that's absolutely correct. Um, the amount of people in prison, and particularly if I focus on the female uh, imprisonment uh, a, a custody, a population in custody, um, the, 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 the number that are in our prisons that have uh, serious mental health issues, um, substance abuse issues, homelessness issues, issues related to poverty and inequality, the Justice Committee know this and know it well. Um, so again, we, we, we have to think about how we do things uh, absolutely radically um, different. And, and, and um, there is not an easy answer to this. And taking the public with us on this journey is going to be hugely, hugely important. It's why I get so frustrated at, and I know I've mentioned it a few times here, but it's why I get so frustrated at the, the kind of paradigm of hard versus soft justice, because it really it brings a simplicity to an issue that is actually very, very complex. Um, and, and, and if we are going to do this, um, regardless of, of who ends up, uh, as, 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 as Justice Secretary in 5, 10, 15, 20 years uh, down the line, uh, we have to make sure we take the public with us uh, on this journey. Okay. Okay. Um, supplementary, Daniel Fulton. Daniel. Is it not my main line of... Oh, it's your main... We thought you wanted to come in in the back of the resourcing of custodial sentences. I asked that sentence for the back of your questions. Could be okay, Apologies if I've caused confusion. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Fulton, did you have anything you wanted to come um, back in? I joined the same boat as Daniel. So. And Lee MacArthur? Yeah, just uh, can I start by uh, very much welcoming the, the, the measure being brought forward? I think the evidence, as Cabinet Secretary, you've, you've alluded to is, is, is overwhelming, not just, I think, in terms of the rehabilitative opportunities through, custodi uh, through um, community-based measures, but actually the move away from custodial sentences that have such a disruptive effect on housing, on employment, on relationships and, and all the rest, which again interferes with um, uh, efforts to rehabilitate uh, individuals. Um, but the resourcing issue is, as Daniel Johnson and others have alluded to, is, is key and has come, come through very strongly in the evidence uh, that we heard. Um, I, I was taken a bit by um, James Maybe's uh, evidence last week where he said, um, the Scottish Government has made some resources available to assist criminal justice social work to prepare for the presumption against short-term sentences. But we're playing catch-up and many of those resources are going into trying to maintain the status quo rather than building uh, new capacity. Um, he goes on to, to suggest that we're running to stand still with the demands on the service and the complexity of the work that we're doing. Very recently, Community Justice Scotland did some work that looked at the prison population and up to 12-month sentences. And the anticipation is that if some of those individuals come on to the community come on to community sentences, they will bring much more complex needs, particularly for mental health support as well as other services. So I think the message coming through from Social Work Scotland is Yes, there have been additional resources uh, put in, but at the moment, those are effectively plugging gaps and allowing uh, the service to, to um, provide for those who are currently uh, on community-based uh, measures. But that if there is uh, any sort of um, uh, uplift in the number of those community-based sentences being um, issued, and, and we hope that that is the outcome of, of, of these provisions, then the resources aren't there to meet not just the expansion of um, the, the need overall, but the more complex uh, needs of certain individuals will fall within that, that group. Can I try to give some reassurances to, 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 to Lee MacArthur and can I thank him uh, for, for um, the, uh, his support and, and his party's support for uh, these progressive uh, reforms. Uh, more generally, I know he's, he's been an advocate uh, for alternatives to custody uh, as opposed to short sentences for, for a long, long time. Um, just to give him that reassurance, um, I, I take what James maybe says very seriously um, and, and what Social Work uh, Scotland have to say very seriously. I did look at his evidence in, in, in a great amount of detail. Um, I did think there was one or two things missing, which hopefully will, will give some, some reassurances. Um, he focused a lot on, on, on the core grant that is given to Social Work Scotland and, and spoke a lot about uh, that, but he didn't um, necessarily refer to the additional uh, investment that we're putting in to, to, to this agenda, uh, which is in the offender services budget line. I think it's probably something for us to look at budget lines and how we make sure that they're more clearly 
um, brought, brought, brought to the surface. Um, but also, I go back to what I said in, in response to a previous question, that CPOs have fallen nationally by 8.3%, but the funding has, has been protected. So I'd like to think there's resource. Now, that doesn't take away from the point that Lee MacArthur makes and, and, and James maybe made, that we're talking about people potentially with very complex needs. And so there is a conversation for us to have very openly with Social Work Scotland to evaluate some of the impact, and we will do that. We will monitor that impact um, um, on, on social work um, in Scotland. What I would say is, of course, if these people were in prison, we'd be spending resource, NHS resource, uh, on, on, on trying to tackle those complex mental health issues, perhaps. Um, but it's really important we do address them, because, of course, addressing those root issues might well help them on the rehabilitative journey. So um, I, I, I don't take... Take, take, take away what's being said. Uh, perhaps the other nuance to, to just throw in, which I think I've mentioned, is you know, with the presumption hopefully going through, um, we think there'll be a, a moderate uh, kind of impact in terms of uh, the numbers who previously would have had a short sentence of 12 months or less um, being, being uh, given an uh, alternative to custody, um, certainly in, in, in the short term. Um, so I don't think it's going to overwhelm the system. Um, I was also interested that, that Dundee City Council, um, with, with their evidence, uh, and I'll quote them on, on the 3rd of June, um, they, they, they said, uh, based on calculations of possible increases in the number of CPOs, if pass is extended, it's anticipated that service is well placed to respond to any increase in structured community alternatives to custody. So I know some local authorities feel in a good place. I think there's others, uh, if I take Borders Council, for example. Um, I know the, the, the recent uh, inspection report uh, highlighted some, 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 some challenges there. So um, I'm not complacent about this issue. We are investing, uh, but of course, I'll work closely with Social Work Scotland to make sure that we can give them as many reassurances as possible and where necessary, uh, of course, help them in, in, in relation to resource. I think it's the resourcing of community sentences we're, we're covering, is, is it still on that? Uh, it because was still the same issue, but no, I'm, I'm happy to come back if, if needs be. Yeah, so. that, that would be good. And Liam Kerr is yours um, on a different, uh, because we're just moving on to use of resourcing uh, of community I'm sentences. I'm keen to just pick up, um, the Cabinet Secretary said that uh, we have to take the public with us, and I just wanted to explore that very briefly, if I could. Okay, yeah. Um, just on that then, Cabinet Secretary, so you said uh, we have to take the public with us and understand the point you're making, but uh, we heard from victims groups <coughs> last week, and of course the victims groups will look at this and say, well look, if you put a criminal in prison, they are, they are being punished, they are uh, a way that the public is being protected, but if we put them in a system where, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary said earlier, a third of orders are never completed, uh, and I think a quarter of orders don't have any work element. Surely the Cabinet Secretary can understand victims' groups saying, well, look, you're not protecting the public um, and you're not delivering any punishment. Does he recognise that? Uh, well, let me just make reference to the evidence that you took. I mean, the committee asked for very targeted evidence and submissions from victims' groups, from academics from uh, from from uh, professionals uh, that are in this field and, and working on the rehabilitative agenda. Uh, and out of all the organisations uh, that submitted evidence, of course, only two organisations were opposed to the extension of the presumption uh, against short sentences. Um, in terms of the element that uh, the percentage that, have, that do not include unpaid work, they do include some really good projects, and I would really... Um, I don't dispute that. Mm -hmm. dispute that. I'm simply putting it that victims will look at what's going on and say, in prison there is an element of punishment uh, and there is an element of public protection, and do, do you not recognise that they would have legitimate concerns that that isn't mirrored on the alternative system? So I'll, I'll come, I was exactly coming to, to that point. And, and of course, it's incumbent on all of us, government and, and, and opposition, uh, to, 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 I think, present a, a true picture of, of what the alternatives are. And of course, to give reassurances to, to the public and, and not scaremonger about the alternatives. And I'll give you one example of, of the alternative that doesn't include unpaid work. That would be the, the excellent Caledonian project. Now, if you haven't visited it, I would commend 
the Caledonian project to, 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 to the member. But what you're talking about there for, for a victim is you're looking at a project that has a success rate of rehabilitating those who've committed domestic abuse offences. Um, and that is surely better for the victim than somebody being given a short sentence um, and, and, and not having that rehabilitative opportunity. Now, of course, and I say this uh, to the member, even though he, he knows this, I know perfectly well, that what we are talking about is a presumption. So every sheriff, every judge will still have the ability to give somebody a short sentence if that is needed for the protection of the public. And domestic abuse cases perhaps are, are one of the cases in point where there will be uh, often uh, perhaps a, a short sentence given to an individual because the protection of the victim is absolutely paramount. So that doesn't, this, this extension of this presumption, it does not affect uh, that. And since you, you've mentioned that cabinet secretary, um, do you think there should be uh, in this presumption that um, domestic abuse should be excluded from the presumption? Scottish women aid is very critical of the plans. It says we're not convinced that the current practice around the use of community disposals is safe in cases of domestic abuse. We consider there is a significant risk that some women and children will be endangered by the extension of the um, presumption. And they've called for domestic abuse cases to be exempted from the presumption. I, I, look, I hold um, Scottish Women's Aid in, in, in the absolutely uh, highest regard, uh, but I do not agree with them on this one. I think it should be up to the Sheriff's um, discretion, uh, the presumption. Uh, of course, there is the ability still to send to prison even for a short sentence, those that uh, commit uh, domestic abuse offences. We, of course, waited specifically for the new Domestic Abuse uh, Act to come uh, into force. The training from the judiciary to have taken place, the training for police officers to have taken place before we brought this presumption uh, into, uh, into, into force, uh, if it does pass uh, the parliament. Uh, what I've also said, uh, what we also know because of that new act, of course, is that there's the ability to apply for non-harassment uh, orders uh, as well. So um, I, I don't think, <coughs> I don't believe in creating uh, exemptions to the presumption. Uh, I think courts are best placed. Um, the vast majority of stakeholders, including the Sentencing Council, for example, um, also uh, agree with that as well. Well, can I put you what Victim for Scotland have said? They've told the committee communities have no faith in community sentencing. That's because it takes too long for someone to be found in breach. Are they wrong with that, Cabinet Secretary? Did you quote exactly that they have no faith? Can you just That's give me what the exact... It says. Communities have no faith in community sentencing. That's because it takes too long for someone to be found in breach. Mm. Well, uh, again, uh, as I said to... My answer to, to, to Liam Kerr, there's genuinely uh, a job for us to do uh, to continue to see the completion rates of, of CPOs uh, increase, uh, and, and I will absolutely do that. <coughs> Excuse me. But I, I think, again, if we are to take the public with us on this, we should present to them the evidence that shows if you want to have less victims of crime, then you should do what is going to rehabilitate more uh, individuals, because uh, if we can rehabilitate uh, offenders, um, then, 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 then of course there will be less victims of crime. And, and there's no doubt, again, as the evidence speaks for itself, that community alternatives are much more effective in that rehabilitative journey than the, the short sentences. Um, because again, Victim Support and Victims Organisation Collaboration Forum both said in their written submissions that the protection of victims and their families under the three-month presumption right now is inadequate. Right now, it's inadequate. And yet we're, we're talking about extending it. And police also have said that um, fewer registered sex offenders will be subject to notification, notification requirements after this comes into effect. This isn't something that's giving either victims or the community at large 
confidence that this presumption should go ahead. Well, no, look, again, I, I disagree uh, with this. I mean, I think if you were to say to the public that those given a short sentence are more likely to commit another crime than those that are given a community uh, alternative, then I think people will say, well, yes, we should deal with the root causes. Uh, we should uh, absolutely make sure that those community alternatives are robust and I accept all of that. But I think the public absolutely would be uh, reassured by that as opposed to just people going in and out of the revolving door uh, of, of prison. And in terms of those convicted of, of a sexual offence who, who are sentenced to a community protection order uh, with an offender supervision requirement, they're required to comply uh, with the, the sex offender notification register for the duration of the offender uh, supervision uh, requirement. Uh, if an offender is, is still uh, assessed as posing a significant risk of sexual harm to the public at the point that their CPO ends, then the police can apply for a sexual offences uh, prevention order, SOPO, uh, which includes the same notification register requirements. Um, we're also introducing legislation, as um, the convener knows well, the Management of Offenders Bill, which will allow uh, electronic monitoring uh, of SOPOs uh, as well. So hopefully that gives some reassurances on the sexual offences side. But I genuinely think um, when it comes to, 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 to victims uh, and victims' organisations, they will want to see less victims of crime in the future. Uh, and that will be helped by this presumption as opposed to short sentences. I think they want to ensure, above all, Cabinet Secretary, the, prote the protection for victims is adequate. Um, Fulton, you had a supplementary, and then we're moving on to Rona. What's the yeah. supplementary, actually? And your questions to Rona. Oh, yeah. no, sorry, yeah. it was Daniel after that. OK, supplementary, Fulton, then Rona. Hey, thanks, Convener. It's quite a specific point on... Um, the judiciary having faith in the, the community alternatives that, that we've spoken about, and I think that there is um, evidence that, that they do have that. But I wanted to ask about particular community payback orders, and if there's any any work going ahead to review any aspects of them. Um, and and what, I'm, what I'm talking about specifically is the cabinet secretary will know that um, a community payback order needs to have a supervision requirement uh, in place, apart from in the instance when it's a standalone unpaid work, so if there's any requirement at all, such as <clears throat> unpaid work with mental health requirement, a supervision requirement needs to be in place. That then does create a situation where um, sentencers, and it's the, only, it's the only situation they have to do this with community payback orders, they might have to give a, a, a requirement that they don't feel to be appropriate, and that would be the supervision requirement. Yeah, I, I assume that that would be a small number of cases because, for example, they couldn't give unpaid work with a mental health uh, treatment requirement with a fine. They would need to add a supervision requirement to that. Is there any thought been given to that aspect of community payback orders? I'm just, I mean, I think the member articulates the, 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 the position um, f fairly well. I mean, uh, the, 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 the unpaid work element um, has been quite successful. There's been seven million uh, hours of, of, of unpaid work that have been carried out in communities. I think probably every member's uh, region or, or constituency they represent will have been um, been affected positively by by some of that um, un, unpaid work. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, of course, it is for the judge to be able to decide and, and select um, what element of, of or what type of CPO. Um, somebody uh, should be given, but, but absolutely it's for the court to make that decision. It may well include, um, as, as a member has rightly articulated, that, that um, supervision may include specific requirements in relation to the treatment of substance abuse, alcohol, uh, drugs, uh, or indeed uh, to tackle mental health issues, or indeed, um, as I've mentioned, programme requirements like the Caledonium uh, programme, uh, which is about, uh, of course, uh, uh, dealing with, with, with those who uh, have, have committed domestic abuse uh, offences. Um, so CPS are, CPOs are, are, are robust. I would say they're credible community sentences, um, but they're not just about payback to the community, although, of course, an element uh, is. There are some that are to do with addressing and, and, and dealing with the root causes uh, of some of that offending behaviour. Okay, from a main line of questions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sure. Rona? Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Just very briefly, just to add some context to what the Convener was saying about breach, 75% um, of CPOs in 2017-18 to 18, um, didn't involve any breach applications, and, and also the number of terminations um, are low, it's around 18%, and that's been fairly consistent. So it's just to add some context to what the Convener was saying. 
Yeah, uh, I, 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 I recognise that. And I think I've said in my answer to, to Liam Kerr that um, we've got to do as much as we possibly can, and we will do, to, to, to increase those completion rates for CPOs. But that's not an argument against CPOs because the alternative, as I say, is short prison sentences uh, where over the third, 35%, are reconvicted uh, to uh, sorry are, are given a uh, reconvicted and given a custodial sentence, so they end up back in jail for a much more serious offence than, for example, most likely to be a breach of a CPO, which is not attending or failure to attend, which of course is serious, but um, you, you would suspect not as serious as the the thirty five percent that end up back in custody for for committing a uh, a crime. Thank you. I, just on that point, Cabinet Secretary, if someone breaches a CPO then prison is often an alternative, and it's an alternative because they've run out of things to do, fines, physical fines, work programmes. Um, someone is just refusing to, as um, we heard last week from... Who was it? Then? From um, the, um, the, the judge, that sometimes there is no alternative. People is just refusing... To, people are refusing to comply with the CPO, so there is no alternative to imposing a custodial sentence. And that's the situation where resourcing and making sure that they actually get some help in prison could make a difference. Just now they get no help. Lord Campbell. I, um, if I heard you correctly, when you were first asking that question, you said um, uh, those on, on a CPO that may breach are often given a custodial sentence. I'm not convinced that's correct unless I, I misheard you. Uh, some of the, 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 you know, it will be up for uh, a sheriff, generally speaking, a sheriff to decide uh, what action to take. There's a whole range of actions that can be taken if there's a breach uh, of a CPO. Uh, it could possibly entail um, in custody, but, um, you know, there could be a whole range of um, actions that a sheriff uh, could absolutely take. But yeah. again, let's not take away from the fact... Accepted, Cabinet Secretary, yeah. but when you run out of that, or when I said, I asked Lord Tumble, do they get a second chance? Yes, they get a second chance, but there comes a point. Maybe another chance. There comes a point that person is refusing to comply. And the only alternative in these circumstances is a custodial sentence. Sure, and, and that's why we have uh, presumption, that's why we have the discretion of the independent judiciary. I'm not arguing uh, with that point, but there are uh, alternatives uh, there. And, and then I go back to, to, to what I've said to, to, to Rona Mackay just a moment ago, that for those that are given a short prison sentence, 35 of a year or less, 35% will end up back in jail um, for a much more serious offence. So uh, if the argument... Uh, and of course, it'll be for you to vote on this presumption or not. But if 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 if, if people vote against this, then understand that the alternative that you're voting for uh, is short sentences. Um, and I'm afraid that the, the 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 figures and the facts about those who end up back in prison are much more stark than for those that uh, don't complete a, a CPO. Daniel, thank you. Um, a number of members have already touched on. Uh, the resourcing points, uh, but I, I think it's important that we understand what the implications are of this, and especially if we want it to be successful. Uh, and you, you, you've already alluded to what's uh, increases and, and the total spend on community justice, but my understanding is that within that, uh, the spend on community justice programmes is 13.6 million, and on community justice services is 10.1, i.e. that comes to 23.7 uh, million pounds, and actually D delivering um, those community justice programmes. Now, for custodial sentences, we know that, that we spend £35,293 per prisoner per year. Cabinet Secretary, do you know what the equivalent figure is for those given custodial sentences? And what would you expect to see in terms of that, that spend, both per prisoner or, or per person sentenced, um, and as a, t a total budget sum in terms of those that the delivery of those sentences uh, forgive me I'll, I'll maybe ask him to, to elaborate slightly but um you know I, I don't have that exact figure uh, in front of me um what we do know of course is that custody is a much more expensive alternative to to, to to community sentences and as i think i said to a question an answer to a question from from rona Mackay, as we radically 
uh, I think, explore and examine our punitive policy and, 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 and shape it in a different direction, the hope would be that we can reprofile some of that spend that is used currently in custody to, to, towards community uh, or, or alternatives. In terms of the additional spend, uh, the investment that we've made in, in community, criminal justice social work over the last few years, um, part of this, of course, is based on forecasting. And forecasting, obviously, isn't an exact science. And therefore, if there is a, a greater uh, demand for community uh, alternatives than we forecast for, then clearly that's a conversation that I've got to have with criminal justice social work, and we'll take that on a year-by-year -year, uh, decision uh, according to our, our spending review. But if you've forgiven me, perhaps I didn't quite get to the nub of, 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 of the question, so I'm happy to explore it. Yeah. I mean, I guess that the nub of it is, is this, is that the only way we'll see reduction in, in spend on prisons is if we actually start closing institutions. They are largely fixed costs, even if there is an average. So there's in all likelihood, while we may see a shift, at, at the very least, and there's going to be an interim period where we are spending an, an increased sum on community sentences, the, and a thousand a year is, is, is the figure that we've, we've just heard, and we'll still be spending the same amount on prison. So what is the likely impact of, uh, on the, the, the overall justice budget how much more money will be spent, uh, you know, in the interim, in the medium term, on, on community sentences? And, and, and I guess the key point, the usefulness of that per prisoner figure is it gives us a benchmark of what's actually being delivered. Uh, and, and I think it would be useful if we had a similar benchmark in terms of what is actually being delivered for people giving uh, community sentences. So it's a question of overall cost impact, but also how are we actually going to monitor this and how it's being delivered? I, I can ask uh, my colleagues uh, to, to, to perhaps come back to, to the member via the, the convener in terms of that figure. I think he's actually right. The, the kind of benchmark figure would be uh, quite helpful. It may, may well exist, but you forgive me, I don't have it to hand. He's absolutely right. that the, There is a, a period where we're going to, of course, keep our prisons um, uh, well resourced uh, and 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 at the same time uh, simultaneously continue to invest in greater amounts in in, in the community uh, alternatives um, so there will be an impact on, on on the justice budget but that is part of the conversations we have year by year uh, in the spending review that's why we've seen the increase in the the the, the, the budget for criminal justice social work uh, and that is part of the conversation I have to have to, for the finance secretary year on year uh, on year there are other but uh, there are other pressures in the prison service, as, as, as the member uh, may well know uh, as well. But, um, you know, th these are, as I say, conversations for, for, for spending reviews. But uh, my hope would be, my desire would be, that in the longer term, that we can absolutely reprofile that spending from prisons to, to community alternatives. But that would need a significant shift uh, in the numbers, significant to the point where he's absolutely right. We can be in a position where I, which I hope to be in, which is that we, we are closing prisons, uh, not, not, not building prisons. Another element in terms of uh, you know, critical success factors for this is actually what happens in, in the community sentences themselves. If you, if you take the 35% recidivism figure that you quoted in terms of short sentences, th there's essentially two reasons why that's happening. One is, uh, as I, I think you have uh, implied, is about the suitability of prison over a short period of time. But actually the other critical element is that there is a, a lack of services provided to short-term prisoners for, for that rehabilitation. Do we not need to do much more to ensure that that is an essential component of whatever sentence people receive for whatever length of time, but including community sentences? And actually, would it not be more to the point, rather than simply a pre presumption, to actually look at what sentence is actually handed down? And I, I point to the example of enhanced combination orders in Northern Ireland, where explicitly judges are required to specify the different elements, both of rehabilitation, other services that might require, and indeed including the, the punishment element, so that there's much greater clarity. Would that not be a, 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 a better approach, or at the very least, a, a requirement to make this successful? I'm not adverse to looking at uh, what other jurisdictions do and 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 how they uh, how, how they do that uh, how they do uh, what they do. So I'm I'm happy to look at any example um, that, that that may well uh, help to to improve matters here, particularly on that rehabilitative 
journey that we want uh, offenders to, to, to be on. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, the 35% figure actually isn't necessarily the recidivism figure. It's the figure that end up back into custody. So there'll be many more that will necessarily commit uh, or reoffend, but perhaps not end up um, back in, in, in custody, is my understanding. Um, in terms of the the uh, the point that he makes around um, budgets, I think it's, it's, it's hugely important. Um, for me, uh, the, the sorry, the point that he makes around the kind of complex needs and addressing those complex needs and having associated budget is hugely, hugely important. It's why in government we're so keen to work cross portfolio. So I'd, I'm struggling to read my own handwriting there, but the the, the, the health and justice collaboration board uh, is is a key element to that closer collaboration, that closer cross portfolio working where. Um, health officials uh, and indeed the health secretary and I will, will be involved, which is trying to deal with some of these root causes. Obviously, before somebody commits an offence, clearly if we can get to the preventative agenda, but if somebody does commit an offence, then where is the best place to deal with that? And prison can't be all things to all people. And I respect what he says that, um, you know, should there be a, 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 a more a rehabilitative focus on short sentences? Um, and, and in an ideal world, well, Yes, but in the previous question, he rightly asked me about the pressures that I already face on my budget. Um, that, so, you know, the real politic of it is that, you know, we have you know, challenging budgets um, and a prison can't do everything. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't look at whether or not we can do rehabilitation better in prisons. Uh, and, for example, through care support is an important part um, of that. Um, but I think if we can deal with these issues in the community... Uh, of course, before somebody offends, preferably, but even if somebody commits an offence, that if we can deal with these issues in the community, I think they will be more effective uh, than perhaps dealing with them in prison. No question, Cabinet Secretary. I've essentially been asking questions about how much money will be spent, because that's important. What it will be spent on, because again, that's important. But the other final point is really how that money is made available. And we hear time and time again from people in this sector, both in terms of delivering these programmes, but also from people involved in sentencing themselves. One of the biggest factors that, that holds back the use of community justice sentences is the fact that we don't have multi-year budgeting, that simply sentences don't know from one year to the next what services are available and what they are able to uh, hand out in terms of sentences. So I was wondering, will you give the commitment to change that system so that that consistency and that certainty that sentences need is available because ultimately is that not what is required to make this successful? Uh, I don't take away from, from, from Daniel Johnson's uh, point of course we are often restricted because of, 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 of the fact that we get single year budgets uh, coming our way from, from, from Westminster and that's not to say that we can't do multi-year budgets because there are some areas where we, we're able to do that uh, with some level of, 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 of certainty. And he does touch upon an important point, which I don't think has been raised um, uh, so far in the discussions, which is that the third sector, <coughs> third sector organisations, <coughs> excuse me, are an important part uh, of this um, of, of this puzzle, of this jigsaw. That uh, they are a vital component to help us deliver. Um, community alternatives and we fund them so if we are able to and I'll certainly give a commitment to explore it I won't give a commitment to, to, to absolutely be able to, to, to enact multi-year budgets but on this agenda I, I, I take what he says uh, very seriously and I think it's a good point so me and my officials would explore uh, whether in, in this particular agenda and the community uh, sentences uh, front uh, are we able to, to, to explore multi-year budgets and again I'll come back to the member uh, with, with an answer. Thank you. Supplementary, Liam MacArthur, then Shona, John <coughs> and Liam Kerr. Uh, thanks, Kevin. I just wanted to return, Cabinet Secretary, to the, the exchange we had earlier. Um, James Maybe's uh, evidence, uh, he, he did refer to the fact that uh, I think several social work authorities receive support from the local authority in addition to the core grant for criminal justice social work. That is simply to maintain services at their current level. So I think there is an issue that needs to be looked at in terms of funding. But the comment you made in relation to um, potentially easing some of the pressure on NHS and delivery of mental health support and to the prison population. I just wonder whether you could offer a reassurance there that actually what's needed in terms of that provision is, is 
is a greater amount of focus within the prison population, irrespective of what's happening in terms of community-based measures. So I wouldn't like um, to see, in a sense, uh, a, a removal of what resource is there and directed into community-based measures. I think, I, I think what all the evidence suggests is that we need more in terms of community-based uh, measures for mental health support, but equally uh, more than is currently being provided within the uh, prison estate. Uh, for the prison population in relation to mental health. Yeah, uh, just on this first point, again, I uh, uh, just reiterate that I take what, what, what James maybe says uh, in, in Social Work Scotland. I uh, have to say very, very seriously, uh, I just would again reiterate the point that the, the increase in funding, um, the, the ring fence criminal justice social work funding uh, is in addition to increases uh, to, 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 to revenue funding, but that's notwithstanding that. Um, I think we'll, we will, of course, listen to what Social Work Scotland have to say when the impact, hopefully, when this presumption, th th this extension is a presumption, passes uh, and, and, and comes into force, then, then we'll keep very close contact with SWS and local authorities, COSLA and, and others, to see the real life impact um, of that and, and, and see where there may be resourcing and budgetary implications. Uh, his, his wide and broader point, uh, more substantial point, uh, you know, I, I think is very, very well made. Um, you know, I, I had a, a very frank conversation with uh, the EU's, uh, I think it's Committee Against Torture, that came here uh, and had a look at uh, a number of our, our prisons and our prison estate, uh, both male and, and female uh, custody uh, units. And uh, they were, you know, they, they presented a real challenge to the government um, about how we do uh, mental health services. Uh, in, in our prisons. I add to that the recent report from the inspectorate uh, and, and jointly by Dr Helen Smith, uh, the expert review of mental health into Pullman, uh, again with 80 odd recommendations, uh, presents some again very stark challenges to, to the government, to NHS, on how we do mental health services within our prisons. Um, so there's a lot there for us to consider. I'm making a, a statement um, I think next week uh, and to, to, to Parliament on that expert review, but I'll, I'll, I'm very open to, to looking at uh, wider issues across the prison estate on how we deal with some of these complex um, health needs. It's not all just resourcing, uh, though I appreciate that's not what the member was saying, but it's not all just about resourcing, of course that's a, an element of it, but even uh, issues like data sharing and information sharing are so, so important. We, we see that the information sharing between uh, various bodies, public bodies, and even the NHS within health workers within prisons versus the, the actual health board uh, is not as good as it should be. So th there's a lot there for us to, to, to do, um, I think, to address some of those very complex needs within our prison population. Shona, then John Minka. So we've touched on, on this um, a little bit about um, the um, variation, I guess, of... Uh, the use so far of the, the three-month um, uh, presumption. And you might have seen the evidence provided um, from Lord Turnbull where um, it was clear that um, some areas were using community uh, alternatives um, than others. So, for example, Alloa seems to be uh, an area which has had um, quite a lot of success in um, in doing that, now we discussed at some length what that what might lie behind that, and we touched on things like was it about trust, confidence in the alternatives, uh, was it about even awareness of what those alternatives are. So I guess I want to to ask you and find out from you what your view is on that and whether or not there's more that can be done, particularly moving to uh, a 12-month uh, presumption that really we need to make sure that not just the disposals are there, but that, that uh, chefs are aware of them and indeed um, there is a trust in their, um, the, the confidence of, of those working. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think judicial confidence is, is key, absolutely key to making the presumption a success as well as resourcing. So it's, it's absolutely right that you um, focus in on, 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 on that issue. Um, th th it can be, uh, frankly, uh, a little bit patchy in relation to the confidence that sheriffs, judges will have uh, across the country. 
and, and that is why Community Justice Scotland are doing a, a power of work to try to instil that greater degree of confidence and reassurance amongst our judiciary. So Community Justice Scotland will often do uh, events where they will invite sheriffs um, and, and, and judges, but mainly sheriffs, uh, to uh, meet with, um, almost like an exhibition style, but meet with um, providers of community justice and community sentences. And they'll have, again, very frank conversations. Some of the feedback from the judiciary has been that when they give somebody an alternative to custody, what's missing for them is the feedback loop. So they don't get the feedback on whether that person has been successful, um, has addressed some of those underlying issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the, the sheriffs tell us, well, if they had that, then they'd be much more predisposed to to give those community alternatives. So we're working hard with Community Justice Scotland to to um, uh, bring everybody up to 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 a really good standard uh, of, of 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 community justice, uh, community sentences. Sorry, across the country. Um, so that work is, is continuing. Um, there are also some sheriffs who are, are real advocates for the community alternatives, uh, and we're hoping that uh, we can persuade them to 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 be advocates um, and ambassadors for uh, community sentences. But clearly, that will be dependent on 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 the work that Community Justice Scotland does to, as I say, uh, make sure that there's robust alternatives in place across the country. I mean, in a I guess brings me on to my second question that um, the, the collection of an analysis of the data on community census is really important here, isn't it? And I know that, um, again, the Scottish Government um, is working with Community Justice Scotland on that because in order to maybe persuade the sceptics, if you like, um, you know, the lessons on what works and the evidence of what works and importantly that feedback loop. So what actually happens... Um, is going to be really important. Do you accept there's an issue there in terms of making that and building that that case uh, as as we go forward and making sure that as well as the the trailblazers, if you like, um, you know, we have that underpinning evidence of saying, well, you know, the evidence speaks for itself. Yeah, no, I I accept that. Uh, we, we, we don't um, have everybody in the country up to the level that we'd like to, to be at. There's some definitely examples of, 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 of really close collaboration between, <coughs> excuse me, the judiciary uh, and community sentence providers, uh, but that is not the standard practice right across the country. So we have to elevate uh, everybody to, to, to that standard. I visited a very good uh, project in, 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 in our growth way. Um, uh, Glen Eyre project and, and the sheriff there, they said it was excellent. Uh, the sheriff would um, <coughs> often, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, send women uh, to that project. It's, it's, it's for, 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 for female offenders. Um, and he would regularly come down to see the project himself, the sheriff. Um, he had a good rapport and relationship with the staff. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, he was really invested in, 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 in the in, in, in the rehabilitative journey, if I can put it that way, of, of, of the offender. So much so to the extent that uh, I was told by Glen Eyre Project, I'm not sure I should be repeating this, but uh, he did say that uh, when, when the sheriff went on his, his annual leave, uh, that the sheriff who replaced uh, him didn't have the same understanding of that project. And, and actually so many more women were diverted to custody as opposed to that. And, 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 and when the sheriff returned from his, his annual leave, he was, he was quite upset that that happened. So um, building those relationships is, is, very, is, is, is absolutely key um, and is part of the work that, that we're doing in Community Justice Scotland are doing. I mean, that's a really important point because there were a few projects that were, were named and pulled out, like the, the Tay Project in, in Dundee. And there is that issue, I guess, of, of if a sheriff is familiar and knows the project, they're more likely to refer. So yeah, I think the... the um, Lord Turbill had mentioned potentially a role for the Judicial Council, is it, in terms of training and <coughs> and raising awareness of, you know, and maybe building those relationships with the, the projects themselves. Is that something you'd encourage? Yeah, it's probably the, the Judicial Institute um, that he's referring to. But yeah, I, I uh, absolutely see a role for, for, for all these stakeholders. If I'm being very frank with you, it can be sometimes a bit tricky from, from, um, from, from the side of the table that I'm on. Um, 
the judiciary are understandably they fiercely guard their independence, and um, you know ministers and, and and politicians generally telling them what they should be doing doesn't really land well with them. Uh, so th at the same time, you know, completely understand uh, that they, they should guard that independence fiercely, and, and I think they absolutely, if they could, I think I think it's fair to say the vast majority of sheriffs, if they could and they felt they could. Um, uh, give an alternative to custody, then that's where they would want to be, um, as opposed to throwing people uh, into into jail. Um, so there's a power of work for us us to do uh, in that regard, and, and, and we're doing it. But certainly, perhaps the judicial institute is part of that. The, the sheriffs' association, perhaps, is part of that conversation, uh, as well as many others as well. Okay, thank you. We can just say some of the members of the committee had the opportunity to go and meet with the Judicial Institute. We were very impressed with um, the work they were doing um, just to make all sheriffs aware of alternatives and um, to talk about current issues that are certainly going to improve the criminal justice system. John Finney. Hey, thank you, Kavita. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary Panel. Cabinet Secretary, I'm still on the issue of resources and uh, the uh, question of impact assessments. Now, if I check the various impact assessments that would normally cover legislation, primarily they all say the same thing, that it's an extension of existing policy. Um, we've talked about the judicial awareness of local options. Can I ask what consideration is given, given that we don't have a, an island's impact assessment, but there are particular unique features to the four, four island sheriff courts and indeed mainland sheriff courts that deal with residents from islands, we give you the example of, uh, by no means unique example of the Caledonian project, where you need an optimum number of people to be participating in a programme to make it effective. Is there a danger that uh, there's a reduced range of options for those convicted in Ireland Sheriff Courts as a result of the... Well, that's a really good point that, that you raise. Obviously, the member knows about the island proofing concept, but you know, you've got a point about secondary legislation and, and, and doing things through through through, through orders, uh, and it's something absolutely I'll take back with to, to, to my officials. What I would say um, from uh, the evidence that was received, I know evidence was received from 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 Orkney uh, and Shetland uh, Islands uh, councils. Um, you know, we have to be aware of those uh, nuances for sure, and we deal with that even when it comes to. Uh, th 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 those in custody. Um, there are nuances in island communities, maybe not particularly necessarily absolutely unique to, to island communities because they may well be in, in rural communities too. There's issues around community alternatives and the stigma associated uh, with them. Um, and we have to be aware and, and alert uh, absolutely to them. Um, but uh, having looked at the evidence by, by some of the island councils, um, you know, I think we'll be able to to, to, to meet the, the challenges of of those of those nuances. Um, if there are particular uh, conversations that he thinks we have to have, then I'm absolutely um, all, all ears uh, to that. The member knows I have a, a good relationship with our island councils from a previous uh, portfolio. Um, but um, you'd be absolutely don't want those in island communities to be disproportionately uh, affected uh, in a negative way. Uh, we want them to have the full range of opportunities uh, for community sentences that anybody else would have. I'm grateful for that response, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, a number of occasions you've mentioned sums of money that have been uh, allocated, and you've used terms like uh, increases ring fenced. I wonder if you can advise if there's sufficient flexibility within criminal justice social work budgets in the island areas and indeed rural areas to accommodate facilitating individuals participating in uh, disposals which might involve groups? I certainly my understanding that there's, that there's flexibility uh, within that money, although, as I say, is ring fenced and, and, and protected, but within that there is uh, flexibility. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, if, if island communities would like to come to me uh, or island councils, would like to raise any specific issues, then I, I will do my best to, to try to address um, some of those challenges, if they feel that there's particular challenges to their communities, I'd be, be absolutely open to that. OK, thank you. Liam Kerr. Convener, if I may. The, um, throughout today, Cabinet Secretary, a lot of the case founds upon this idea that community sentences are much more effective uh, in terms of reoffending. Uh, now, the committee heard last week that uh, making a straight comparison of reoffending rates between those given a short custodial <coughs> sentence and those given a community sentence can actually be somewhat misleading uh, because of the difference in the extent of previous 
offending amongst the two groups. I'd be interested to know, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that? And if so, doesn't it make it rather challenging uh, to make this change without a further analysis and understanding of what's going on there? First thing I would say is, is it's not an idea, as he describes it. I mean, the research really does bear it out. And, and, and I've, I've said to him, uh, and indeed uh, even the convener, uh, if you would like to, to present uh, an alternative to, to, to that uh, overwhelming research, then I think you will find yourself really isolated. So it's borne out very much by the evidence. The point that he makes, though, is, 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 is an absolutely correct one. I think people have made that point, that uh, the, the profile of individuals who may well be diverted from custody would perhaps be different to those that are given a custodial sentence. So I absolutely accept that. And my colleagues at Justice Analytical Services um, have, 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 you know, have, have uh, looked at that issue. And it is possible to control uh, to control for these differences. Uh, and so while the gap may well narrow, so you may well, if you control for those factors, uh, you may not, the, the figures may not be uh, that um, those in, in, given a short custodial sentence uh, are reconvicted twice as often or nearly twice as often, even if the gap does narrow, uh, still very much finds that there's a statistical significant difference um, in rates of, 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 of reconviction, even if you control for those factors. So you're right, again, you might, difference uh, there might be a nuance or there might be a difference in in, in in the in the rate but statistically there's still a significant difference um between reconviction rates those given a short sentence versus community sentence even controlling for those differences um, finally, Cabinet Secretary, what types of cases may attract custodial sentences of up to 12 months um, or even 18 months, considering the possibility of a one-third sentence discount for an early plea? Well, that would be for a sheriff to decide, uh, for the judiciary to decide what cases. I mean, uh, when it comes to, to, to d discounts, so I know Lord, Tur Lord Turnbull gave uh, some evidence to, to the effect that um, uh, there may be an 18-month sentence, an early discount would bring that down to 12 uh, months potentially, and then within the within the gambit of the presumption. But uh, again, I go back to that point that this is just a presumption. So two things. One, this is a presumption, so it's up to the individual sheriff to decide whether or not, even if that person falls into the, 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 the gambit of this 12-month uh, or less sentence, or whether that person should go to jail or not. So they absolutely can send somebody still to jail if they think that is the most appropriate place for them. And for the more serious offences that would take you to, to, to that point, then, then, then you could imagine that that well, that may well be um, uh, what, what a sheriff decides to do. And I suppose the second point is that I think our sheriffs are, are <coughs> the ones certainly that I've engaged with are, are clearly very, very intelligent. You, you've mentioned that you've been impressed by the work that the Judicial Institute has done, Sheriff Duff and his team, in terms of training the judiciary. They will be very aware that this presumption has come into force if. Uh, it passes, uh, of course, uh, and therefore you would think that they would bear that uh, somewhat uh, in, in mind. Um, I know Lord Turnbull perhaps uh, was, 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 was sceptical on that point, but you would think that they would take that uh, on board. But ultimately, um, really the answer to your question is that this is a presumption, uh, not a ban. Therefore, anybody given any sentence, um, be it 12 months, be it 10 months, five months, uh, they can still be uh, very much sent to, sent to jail. That is up to the discretion of the judiciary. Well, can I perhaps quote from Lord Turnbull? Offences that might be in the category could include causing death by careless driving, causing death while driving while disqualified, possession of indecent photographs of children, possibly the distribution of lower category images, possession of offensive knives and weapons, assaults, and perhaps some drug um, supply charges, sexual offence charges, and charges of multiple um, housebreaking. By any stretch of the imagination, these are very serious um, potential uh, offences that will be covered by any presumption of 18. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, do you consider the risk assessment is fit for purpose given that we heard last week from um, James Maybe, Social Work Scotland, that their risk assessment rely only on what the offender themselves tells them, not the evidence in court? 
Uh, yes, I think a risk assessment is, um, is solid. It's, it's robust on this. Um, um, look, <laughs> we cannot, uh, never in the justice portfolio, are uh, we able to eliminate the risk to absolutely uh, zero. Even when somebody is in custody, of course, they can go on to commit crimes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, those can be the, the most heinous and, and, and worst of crimes in custody. They can commit uh, crimes of, of uh, people have been, of course, have committed uh, sexual crimes, have committed uh, murder. Or, uh, within the prison estates, so whether somebody's in custody or not in custody, then of course eliminating that risk to zero is, is simply not possible. In terms of the the list of offences which um, you mentioned and and, and, and you quote uh, Lord, Lord Turnbull in that, again I would make two points. One that again the discretion lies with the sheriff. So the individual sheriffs, the judges, they have the discretion on whether the seriousness of offence merits a custodial sentence or indeed a community attentive, regardless of whether it falls into the presumption of 12 months or not. And the second point I'd make is, particularly as the Justice Secretary, but I think even as the convener of, of this committee, we have to believe in people's ability to rehabilitate. And I have to believe that people have that ability regardless of the crime. And this is perhaps a controversial bit, that even those that have committed the most heinous of crimes, I have to believe that they have the ability to, to, to rehabilitate. Some, of course, will be beyond that, but I have to believe that the overwhelming majority have the ability to rehabilitate. So even that list of offences, and she's right to call them serious offences, even those list of offences that she reads out, I have to believe, and I do believe, that people have the ability to rehabilitate. Now, if I believe that, as I do, then I have to ask myself, what does the evidence show me and demonstrate is the most effective way to rehabilitate somebody? Is it a short sentence or is it a community alternative that addresses root causes? And again, as I've said throughout this um, committee session, it is undoubtedly community alternatives. So yes, judicial discretion important, but also we cannot take away from the fact that the rehabilitative impact of community sentences is far greater than short sentences. Point, um, Cabinet Secretary, we have to ensure that we pass legislation that protects the public. Uh, and it's been the Cabinet Secretary's choice to extend the presumption to 12 months. The Law Society have asked, why not six months? Why not nine months? And of course, um, we all believe in rehabilitation, but as the Wise Group have told course, us time yeah. and time again, that rehabilitation has to be properly resourced. And for the three months presumption, it hasn't been. And certainly um, there must be a question over how extending it to 12 months is a sensible way forward. I don't agree with the fact that three months hasn't been uh, pro properly resourced uh, at all. And, and, and the 12 months, I thought I made mention of this, in a previous answer, but perhaps I didn't. But the 12 months was chosen for very, you know, very good and legitimate reasons for 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 avoiding the issues around up tariffing because of the, the 12 month summary, um, uh, summary sentencing uh, limits uh, that that we have. It's also because you quoted Lord, Tur Lord Turnbull. Worth mentioning that Lord Turnbull himself says that community sentences are, are recognised as robust, and I'm quoting directly, recognised as robust and not a soft um, option. So uh, I think those are important points to make on the record. I don't think anyone's disputing that, Cabinet Secretary, but the situation is as, as I outlined. Shona Finan. Weakness, and I think the official record will, will show this. Immediately after reading out that list, Lord Turnbull then went on to say, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, that he had faith and confidence that if the crime was of a serious enough uh, nature to merit a custodial sentence, then that is what would happen. And I think for completeness, it's important to put that on the record. I think that concludes our questioning. Thank you for that. Agenda item three is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and had no comments on it. The motion will be moved, an opportunity for a formal debate if that's necessary. The motion is motion 17438, that the Justice Committee recommends that the presumption against short periods of imprisonment Scotland order 2019 draft be approved. Cabinet Secretary to speak and move the motion. I move the motion uh, in my name. Do any members wish to speak against it? 
uh, wish to, to speak. Um, I, I'll only reiterate what, say, what I said um, and what I've um, said during uh, the debate that I'm not convinced that this is a sensible way forward to protect the public and for that reason I'm not in favour of it. Um, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? Only to say that um, uh, I'm disappointed, uh, of course, Convener, uh, but uh, the, I'm pleased that the, the, the evidence is so robust uh, and that uh, I hope that this uh, presumption is passed uh, and therefore we will have more people rehabilitated and, of course, less victims uh, of crime. Okay. The question is that motion 17438 in the name of Hamza Yusuf be approved. Are we all agreed? No. no. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Seven in favour, two against. Uh, seven in favour, two against. Um, next week, we will consider the final report on the basis of today's result. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for attending and will suspend attending and suspend for a five minute comfort break.
Agenda item four is continuation of our inquiry into secure care for children and young people in Scotland, and I'm pleased to welcome a panel of witnesses for today's meeting, comprising of Kirstine Hogg, Head of Policy, Bernardo Scotland, Deborah Nolan, Practice Development Manager, Centre for Youth and Criminal Justice, and Karen Dybal, Head of Children's Services, North West Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership. I thank all the witnesses for um, their written evidence, which the uh, committee finds really, really helpful in advance of us actually hearing from you in person. I refer members to paper three, which is public paper, and paper four, which is private paper. And um, can I start by asking the committee, uh, sorry, the panel, the committee has heard of the complex health issues and needs that many children and young people present when they enter secure custody. Can the witnesses say, have those issues and needs changed over time? And if so, our responses to these issues, should they be managed and um, should they be keeping up with developments? Who'd like to start? Well, from my perspective, um, in Glasgow, the numbers of young people who come in and out of secure care have reduced over the years, but that's really with um, quite a focus on alternatives from our perspective in a Glasgow context. That probably looks different across Scotland, but in Glasgow we have a number of effective interventions where we try and support young people to stay in their own communities. Um, I think from that perspective, the numbers have changed from Glasgow. So at its height, we might have had 35 young people. Today, we have 10. Um, the numbers and the focus has changed from sentencing to welfare provision in secure care. Um, I think we're very much focused in the community and trying to support um, young people to stay in their families. And certainly, I know you've taken evidence before where there's been quite a focus on the issue of social isolation. So we're really clear from a Glasgow perspective if we are to address social isolation, we want children and young people to stay in their own homes, to have that done in the widest sense. I think people have talked before about fixing young people and fixing mental health issues in a secure context. And I think we are clear, while we can try and reduce the worst effects, we're not effectively fixing young people. So we need to look at solutions for young people beyond their period of secure care before and after, so that we can get the best possible outcomes. Okay, uh, anyone else? Uh, yeah, we yes. would um, absolutely agree with the evidence that you heard from the Chief Inspector of Prisons around the complexity of um, the needs that are faced by the young people um, that we are supporting um, through our services in Poland. Um, and then what we would also add um, to the evidence that you heard around a greater incident of mental health need, but not necessarily that manifesting as a greater instance of mental health um, diagnosable conditions. And I think that in some cases, um, that's less about changing um, needs or an increase in needs, but it's about a greater understanding of those needs, um, and in particular, a greater understanding of the impact of adverse childhood experiences, developmental trauma. Um, that's not to say that these experiences are deterministic. Not all young people who grow up um, in adversity uh, will go on to develop these symptoms of trauma, um, but many of them will, and particularly the prison population that we see, uh, the young people who are in Poland, um, may, very many of them will have experienced uh, trauma, bereavement, uh, loss, different experiences uh, which need to be supported. So that would certainly be something um, where we would want to see uh, a focus. And sometimes that can be something as simple as focusing on the relationships that those young pe people have. They needn't be always very complex interventions. Okay, and Deborah? Yeah, I think we would echo that. Um, certainly in terms of um, from the secure care um, kind of data and information, as well as the information on the number of young people in custody, we all we have seen a reduction. So if we take custody in the first instance, we've seen a, re a, a significant reduction in the number of young people in custody. However, what we are hearing is there is a massive increase in the complexity of need of those young people. So whereas last month, on average, we had um, 38 under 18s in our young offenders institution, certainly the information that's available to us would suggest that that complexity is much higher. So much higher level of adverse childhood experiences, of um, often manifesting in trauma, high levels of mental health and emotional wellbeing needs, um, high prevalence, for example, of things like learning disabilities, substance misuse for those young people. 
Likewise, in terms of secure care, we know that secure care is our most restrictive form of care. And um, those children um, who are, are in secure care will often be presenting with very high, very um, extreme levels of, of needs and vulnerability. Um, and likewise, while, as, as, as um, was mentioned previously, while there has been a real change and there has been ongoing fluctuations in terms of our number of young people in secure care, those young people are presenting with an extremely high level of needs. Um, and I think need is the crux of this uh, and the crux of probably a lot of the discussion that we will have today is how do we ensure that we can most appropriately meet those complex range of needs of those children um, as opposed to being, being a serv service driven in terms of how we respond and being really based on what the needs of those children are. Both Kirsten and, and Deborah have mentioned adverse childhood um, experiences, which is a, a term that's become more in vogue, but by no means um, a new term, because we know for, for decades now that children have uh, experienced um, these kind of um, problems. In particular, um, the victims of childhood sexual abuse uh, do you think enough is being done so people can disclose in a safe environment within schools and other places where it could perhaps um, have an early intervention? Uh, because we know the vast majority of the perpetrators are in a p position of trust, um, often family members. Um, is enough being done to tackle that particular issue? That being able to disclose is obviously a very important um, first step, but where my colleagues in the NSPCC, um, through their Right to Recover uh, report, I think uh, probably about a year ago, um, they've identified that where we do have a gap in Scotland is in the support services, that once people have disclosed, once people have come forward, um, that we have a real lack of that sort of specialist um, support for those particular circumstances. Okay, that's helpful. Anyone else like to comment? Karen? I think there's a genuine commitment to creating as many opportunities as possible. I know in Glasgow some of the PEF money has been used for an increase in counsellor, time and availability, and there's a commitment in Glasgow that every school will have a counsellor so that every young person will have access to counselling. In Glasgow there are a number of bespoke services to support children and young people. So I think there is a growing understanding and awareness that young people need the opportunity to seek support, not necessarily from statutory services, but that we create a range of opportunities through partnership with third sector to allow children and families to make the approach that feels comfortable for them. I think that's very important. That's at a time they don't feel it's sort of out of their hands. Things are, are growing arms and legs that they're comfortable about the way ahead. Thank you for that. Uh, Jenny, Thank sorry, you. was there a Okay, Jenny, sorry. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, I'd just like to ask a question around about social isolation, which has already been mentioned this morning. Um, the HMIPS report from Polman says that social isolation as a key trigger for self-harm and suicide should be minimised with a particular focus on those held on remand and during the early weeks of custody. I'd just like to get the panel's thoughts on the impact of social isolation on young people in general. The evidence in the um, mental health review and the, the evidence that was um, completed in terms of the in terms of um, suicide um, by um, SS, SCCJR was very clear about the detrimental impact of social isolation on children. I think the um, what was very helpful from that review was the broadened definition of what social isolation is and the various factors that contribute on the social isolation, particularly for our children in custody. Remand was clearly a huge factor within that report and was um, very, a very large factor in, in terms of the isolation of these children. Um, and I think this has given us an important window of opportunity to again think about our use of remand for these children and how we can ensure that if children are being remanded, they are enab enabled to benefit have the maximum benefit of that time in custody, whereas what that report has made extremely clear is that during that period, often those opportunities are, are not available for the children. Um, likewise, that really echoes some of our findings from our own work with young people in custody um, and, and with partners, partner organisations that access um, to services for children on remand can be inherently difficult. 
Um, as well as seeing uh, social isolation as a, a factor in and of itself, um, we can also consider it, if we look through a, a trauma lens, as a sort of a layering factor, because relationships are something that can really be very, very beneficial. Um, trusting relationships built up over time can be very, very beneficial to young people who, who have experienced that sort of um, mental uh, mental health, who need mental health support because of their experiences of trauma. So social isolation then becomes not only a factor in and of itself, but it prevents you from from getting some of the support um, that you need. So as part of our youth work support um, empowerment, we have youth workers who will go out to the young people who um, you heard about in the previous session, you some young people who simply don't feel able um, to come out, who just want to stay in their rooms. Um, and our youth workers will go in to try to develop those relationships with those young people, try to help them, uh, support them perhaps to, to feel confident to come to maybe smaller group work or something along those lines. So um, there is support there, but resource issues, um, as always, come into play. There is a, a limit to the amount of time that can be devoted um, to trying to break down those barriers and develop those trusting relationships. Thank you for that, uh, Kristen Hogg. I'd like to pick up on that point um, because the Centre for Youth and Criminal Justice also points to the fact that there's no requirement for individuals on remand to undertake work or educational classes and many young people on remand refuse offers to do so, thereby exacerbating these problems of social isolation. You know, should it be enforced then that, you know, you're talking about your colleagues having to go into um, cells, for example, to get young people to engage with educational opportunities, should there be a choice factor in there if they're cutting themselves off whilst they're in custody or should there be actually enforced, I suppose, educational opportunities? All of our services, all the support that we offer is available to uh, young people on remand, but it's very, very highly subscribed. So um, in contrast to the services that you heard, uh, the, the, the reports you heard last time about young people not wanting to engage, um, we find that our youth work service and our um, here and now service, which um, specifically helps young people who've experienced trauma, bereavement and loss, um, are massively oversubscribed. So that, I suppose the resource, the resource um, element of that would be very important that if there is um, if, if all young people who are on demand are also asked to access those services then at this point certainly the ones that we provide are, are full to capacity and, and they're the ones which we understand young people are saying um, we like to come and work with you. You, you we like the relationships that you build with us, we like that you trust us um, that's come through in a number of the reports um, including the Chief Inspector's report so it, even within a compulsion, I would imagine there still needs to be a degree of choice. And if the services that people do want to support them are oversubscribed, then that's another part of the dynamic. Mm. From a statutory service provision perspective, um, I would see the focus on developing good relationships with young people as a conduit in to encouraging them to participate. And I suppose that relationship with third sector, where you've got investment in services that can and do have the capacity to build those relationships, I think is the way forward in custody and out with custody, that we're developing services. There's a range of services available to lots of young people pre-custody that they choose not to take. And I think we would need to see a shift in, in service provision so that we are clear that we're providing the right types of services so that young people feel they can safely engage and build relationships pre and post custody and Thank hopefully you. avoiding custody. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Liam McArthur. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning. I just wanted to follow up actually the, the line of questioning the convener uh, was pursuing uh, earlier on. I think you've identified that while we've seen a reduction in, in, in numbers, actually the complexity of some of the issues that um, the, uh, the, the children, young people are, are dealing with are, are more significant. It, it, would it be fair to say that actually across the secure care sector and, and, and uh, custodial units, that the provision of CAMs and, and, and other support for mental health issues is is patchy, or is is there a kind of a, a consistency there <coughs> um, uh, to, to your mind? It's important that we differentiate between secure care and custody, okay? And I think in our submission we spoke about some of the risks certainly that young people find about the equation of those two two environments because they are very different environments, um, and, and we may well come on to discuss that. Um, I think there is, in both environments, there have been significant concerns raised about the health provision and the in-reach of services. Um, in terms of the previous evidence session, I know there was discussion about 
help um, access to mental health services for the secure care providers and um, that some of the challenges within that. So some of the challenges that have been raised um, and that were raised in that session were in terms of um, responsibility, in terms of lack of clear health pathway for children in secure care to access health services, in terms of equity of access. Um, and I think there was also some issues raised and certainly were raised through the National Secure, Secure Care Project about that interface between a child's placing health board and authority, as well as with the health board or authority that were hosting um, the secure um, secure centre and the child there. So there are some real challenges around about that access to services for our children in secure care. Um, there are, as, as, as I'm sure the committee will be well aware, also numerous concerns about children in the community's ability to access health services, mental health services in particular. Um, so there is quite a complex picture there that is magnified for our children in secure care. Um, the Secure Care um, National Standards for Secure Care have recently been developed and they very much build on um, the calls for action that came from the National Secure Care Project and they do give a focus to how do we ensure young people gain the health support that they require um, and the standards are, are, are due to be launched in due course which should um, it should um, help assist with that situation. However, we need to ensure that our health boards are recognising and are on board as key partners to them as well. And it might be an unfair question, but I mean, from all of that, are, are there priority areas to, to, to your mind that need to be focused upon, maybe not as a silver bullet, but that would, that would make a significant um, difference in addressing um, those sorts of concerns? For our children at the point where they are in secure care, we need to be ensuring that we're meeting their health needs fully and that needs to be a partnership approach so the secure care centres do provide a high level of mental health support and they provide mm -hmm. programmes and interventions but there's much more of a holistic focus on what that whole system can provide to the children within um, while they're in secure care. However, um, that needs to be a partnership approach as well of, with community partners to ensure that there's that in-reach and also then that continuity of care when those children are leaving secure care centres and returning to their home environment. Sorry, I, so I would want to yeah. de echo Deborah's point in relation to that, that, that even young people who have access to CAMS and forensic CAMS in the community, as soon as they move, they have to shift who's delivering their mental health services, which is an issue for young people. And I think that will even be an issue when we have a hospital based in Irvine, because that's in Irvine, and if you're getting a service delivered from Glasgow, you, you'll not get that. It'll be a different deliver of the service and I suppose what, what's been a thread throughout all the kind of evidence is the importance of relationships and at the point where you come into secure care and I suppose we've described that, the, the law describes that as a last resort, you're then having the further challenge of a complete change in caregiver including um, mental health services even where the provision was good. Um, I think at best we are able to use services available to us. So in Glasgow we are very fortunate we have forensic CAMs and that allows us to have a formulation for the young people. So that allows you to say, here are the particular challenges for that young person and here's how the caregivers should meet their needs regardless of where they go. So I would see that as something really important to build on in the future to get the best possible care for young people. Both talked about the importance of, of, of continuity, um, which again was the message we were getting from, from the previous panel. Um, but the, the concern was highlighted around the, the, the funding structure that can, that can almost rub against that in terms of the uncertainty about who's going to be providing services over the, uh, over the longer term. Is that, a, is that a concern that you would share? Is there a need to, to build in a, 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 a greater visibility of, of, of funding and, and certainty about who's going to be providing services? I'm not entirely sure, sure of the question there. I, I'm not sure if you're referring to the model of funding for secure care yeah, yeah. and secure care services. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the evidence indicates that there are, are various concerns about our current approach to commissioning secure care services for our children. Um, I think those those concerns have been illustrated on multiple levels. So in terms of um, the, the the kind of um, market approach in terms of lack lack of national commissioning model however 
we should still be able to provide a continuity of care for our children because health boards will have a responsibility to these children throughout their journey and likewise for the local authority who are responsible for that child while they are placed in secure care they will still have that responsibility when that child transitions out from secure care as well by virtue of their position of, as the lead professional so there are structures in place to support continuity however it's how they're working at the current time which is part of the challenge is that a view shared by yourselves in yeah. Glasgow? Yeah. yeah, and I think it's further complicated by, and it, and it may well come up, the placement of in children from English local authorities. So at any given point, between 30 and 50 per cent over the last couple of years have been. So you're then dil diluting your local knowledge and expertise of CAM services to deliver services that are not developing the themes around Scottish children who have different needs, different placement times. So that further complicates an already complicated picture, I think. Um, I think it's it's very important when we're talking about um, how mental health supports within um, Pullman or mental health supports that can be accessed within secure care and how they interact with services in the community. Um, it's really important, as Debbie said, to put that in the context of some of the challenges that are faced um, by young people across the board trying to access mental health support um, within the community. So we do have examples um, where for young people, entry to Pullman is the first time that their <coughs> mental health needs have been properly addressed. It's the first time that they've been able to access that support. Um, so that's by, by no means the norm for everyone, um, but the challenges around accessing mental health support, particularly for um, young people who perhaps are looked after, where um, the instability of your lifestyle, um, the instability which is caused by the system which might move you between placements um, might mean that you couldn't access CAMS or young people who we know are using uh, drugs and alcohol as a coping mechanism for um, their mental health problems um, might sometimes not be able to access CAMS because of that. So sometimes um, the, the mental health support for people in particular who do have a diagnosable mental health um, condition, some of the young people that we've worked with who haven't been able to access CAMS to support them through that in the community have been able to get access to that support once they're in Poland evidence that then their behaviour is, is much around trying to put themselves in the position where they're going to get the support for CAMS that they're not getting in the in the community, that, that there's a, a pattern of offending behaviour in order to, to, to put themselves back into either secure care or, or indeed to, to, to Pullman? Um, I don't think the numbers that we work with are great enough for me to be right. able to make that sort of call. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary, Daniel Johnson. So uh, I think the, the partnership working point that the panel have made is, is absolutely key. And obviously a, a, a key element to that being successful is making sure that the practitioners on the ground, whether it's in secure care or, or within Pullman, have the relevant training so that they can identify and refer. Um, and indeed that, that point's made very clear in the, the HMIPS report on mental health services at HMP Pullman. But I, I think one point of concern I had was discovering that the mental health training that was being provided wasn't covering neurodevelopmental disorders. And I think in particular that, that same report pointed to the fact that 50% that of, of, of uh, people in Pullman may have some form of uh, learning disability or difficulty and uh, diagnosable. Um, so that seems to be a, an oversight. Uh, I was just wondering what the panel's thoughts are in terms of delivering that training and what the content of that training uh, should be, and, and, and in particular, whether there needs to be particular focus on neurodevelopmental disorders. I think we need to equip our workforce to meet the identified needs of the children who they will be providing care to. So um, we re there any training input would need to cover that broad spectrum of needs. So we've spoke about adversity, we've spoken about trauma, the high level of, for example, um, young people with learning disabilities or speech language and communication needs, so maybe 50 to 90 percent of the um, population of young people in young offenders institution having speech language communication needs. We've also got growing development about the impact of traumatic brain injury, for example, um, and the high, high prevalence of that, as well as diagnosed and undiagnosed mental health needs. So um, it's really important that we can equip our workforce to understand those needs, understand how best to support those children who have those needs, but also that we're able to recognise the distinctive um, nature 
of child development and what children need as children, because fundamentally these are all children first and foremost. So we need to be ensuring that our training is tailored to an understanding of, of children, because very often what we do is we use either adult programmes or adult training courses or... Um, for example, training that's been developed around about working with adults and try to apply that to working with children, which we know fundamentally doesn't, doesn't work because it's based on a, a, an understanding of a different cohort. So training is fundamentally important. However, I think there's something else that's extremely important, which is around about the culture and environment that we provide for these children because we are talking about, so relationships are hugely important, having well-trained staff is hugely important, having specialist interventions is very important, but actually the culture and environment that these children are living within is, is hugely important as well and will shape their day-to-day -day experiences that they have. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about trauma-informed environments, how we can make trauma-informed environments. And I think we need to be very realistic about how challenging it is to do that within facilities that um, very often are set up and have a key component about punishment. And there was a lot of discussion in the earlier session about that. And through the work that CYCJ and, and Bernardo's have done in conjunction in trying to support our um, employment in terms of their journey to become trauma-informed, which is an absolutely admirable and, and, and good intention to have, we need to be really realistic about how difficult that is to achieve in practice. So some of the real complicating factors about providing a trauma-informed environment are resources, so about staff availability about time about um, staff support so things like training but also supervision for staff and support, caring for our staff to care for the children who they're looking after but also about the environment the physical environment that's provided and the cultural environment can all be real barriers to the ability to provide trauma-informed care to the children um, who are who are within um, a young offenders institution can I just ask you one point of clarification? Did you say 50 to 90% of children or young people have so, speech and language? There's very wide estimates, but for our young people in um, young offenders institutions, would be the estimates are within those ballpark. So actually, if we flip that on its head, if we approach it for the majority of children who are in a young offenders institution will have speech, language and communication needs, we should then be tailoring our approach to, to um, providing communication inclusive environments for all children because most of those children will be presenting with those levels of need. And, and I suppose um, from our perspective, whether there's an opportunity today in, in respect to the work that's been done to think about a different service provision other than the as is, that yes, it would be better to have training for the staff and the current provision, but whether there's an opportunity for us to think about visioning what we would like for Scottish children beyond Pullman and the existing secure care, care delivery. So could we be doing something different? Let's ask briefly also about variability. So in the HMIPS report, it, it, it stated that there was a, typically an eight-day referral period um, for a young person to be referred to, to, to CAMS. And I think that the panel that uh, subsequently reflected that, that that was much better than what was experienced in the secure care uh, environment. I'm just wondering more broadly is, is, what the, the sort of the, the variation there is, both between uh, Pullment and secure care, but also within the secure care in terms of referral and, and also levels of, of, of training. Anyone? I don't think I can comment on um, the referral timescales. I know there has been a lot of work done on that. I think we can um, certainly comment on training. Um, so there will be, um, the, again, just echoing my previous points about ensuring our training is, is, is child-focused, but also about a role-in programme of training within both environments being hugely important because we know people change, people move on, and ensuring that the training is, is, is tailored to the needs of the child is really important as well. Thank you. You can always follow up in writing anything that occurs to you after this evidence <coughs> session. Uh, we're now moving to Rona Fulton, John and Shona. Thank you. Rona. Um, thanks. I'll be brief because a lot of what you've said has kind of answered my question. don't want to labour the point about training, but um, the HMIPS report um, stated that no NHS staff with training in adolescence and none of the clinical staff have undergone the essential CAMS competency training that would be routine in staff appointed to a CAMS service. So given that prison staff are dealing with very vulnerable children on a day-to-day -day basis, um, has 
this resulted in has this report resulted in a change? Is there a positive change in training for staff um, to deal with the children? You know, out with the specialist cam services. Um, is that actually happening? Is what I'm trying to say. I don't think we can answer that question. I think that would be it would be Scottish Prison Service who would need to advise what they have done. Mm -hmm. I understand that they had there has been some commitments made, and in the inspection report that went alongside the. Um, Mental health review. There was certainly um, some commitments had been had already been progressed in terms of training and support to staff. But it would be for SPS, I think, to give you a clear breakdown of what they intended to do on the back of that. And how would would you agree that that is critical, though, for children in Pullman to have, given that day to day it's, it's staff that they see, um, that those staff be be trained properly? Absolutely, um, absolutely. Okay. I think there's a raft of of complicating factors in ensuring that happens, but it's absolutely necessary, yes. Okay. Thank you. And Fulton. Uh, thanks, Convener. Good, good morning, panel. And I, I know that, um, Deborah Nolan, you, you, you touched on this um, briefly in your last answer, and I do apologise if it came up um, more substantially and I've um, missed it, but I wanted um, a comment on um, the interaction between the secure, uh, care services and Pullman at the point when a young person uh, is moving over. Do you think that process is working well just now? And I think that's a, that's a it's a very welcomed question and a very welcomed area of focus for as tr transitions. We know that transitions for young people um, are very often major life events and very often traumatic life events. Okay, and that can be for children entering secure care or custody. Um, from the community, moving within establishments and then returning back to the community. What I would say is that under the whole systems approach, which is Scottish Government's policy um, and framework and national approach to working with children at risk of or involved in offending behaviour, um, there is a, a raft of guidance to support um, young people making that transition and to inform practice. So there's um, various different pieces of, of guidance to inform that practice. We also have a real raft of evidence from young people as well as um, from, from stakeholders about what can work and what can aid those transitions and what can make them most effectively as well as lots of examples of extremely good practice um, to support young people making that transition. There's a couple of I think very complicating factors at times in those transitions however. One is when those moves are done on an unplanned basis for whatever reason, um, can make it extremely difficult to um, ensure that those transitions are managed appropriately or done in the best possible way that they can be. Um, and, and I think at, at times that, that can make it very difficult to make sure that the guidance and the good practice that there is implemented if that young person is moving on a crisis basis. I think what's important is where we have examples where young people are moving or on unplanned or crisis basis, we're able to reflect on the reasons that led to that and what we did during those periods of times and also what we could do more effectively in future either to prevent unplanned crisis moves or to um, make sure that when those do happen we're able to manage them as effectively as possible. What the inspection and the mental health review has done has um, highlighted that at times those transitions are not handled as well as they could be, and at times the flow of information can be troublesome. Um, linking back to what we said earlier about the importance of continuity, um, all addressing all of those factors is therefore extremely important. And, and picking up on that last point, um, do you or any of the other uh, panel members have any evidence of um, or information regarding what the actual impact is of these transitions, perhaps when they're not done well, or even when they are done well, what the impact is um, on a, a young person's mental health? The wealth of, of, of an evidence base that um, talks at length about the impact of, of depriving a child of their liberty. So at, at that, as that initial transition, and then if we're talking about subsequent transitions from that, um, there has been a lot of work done by colleagues down south through an organisation called Beyond Chief Custody who actually say that the, um, the transition, um, who have spoke at length about the transition from a young person from moving from um, the community to a custodial or secure environment and returning back, the impact that that can have and the detrimental impact that that can have on a young person's mental health and how challenging that period can be. Um, so I think there is a lot of evidence out there that indicates how, how, how challenging for a child those experiences can be. 
Um, we would also draw attention to the transition um, out, out of um, secure, care, either secure care um, or, or indeed out of Pullman, um, particularly in relation to trauma. We know that symptoms relating to trauma spike um, before people are going to transition out of that support um, and that the first six to eight weeks back in the community are really critical. But we also know that that's where it's really difficult to find a support service. So um, our here and now trauma bereavement and loss service for a while had a transitions worker who particularly tried to work with young people who were to be released to make sure that they had support within the community and in some local authority areas that was possible and in some local authority and health board areas that wasn't possible the support just wasn't there and um, so I think that focusing on that transition out as well is also very important and we have two staff dedicated to Pullman to support young people to make that transition back out I think it's enormously difficult for young people who go into secure to get the right um, route for them to come out of. Um, it becomes a really big challenge when young people have been in secure care, getting the right package post-secure care. Um, there's a real reluctance sometimes across providers to take young people with the kind of profiles that have gone into secure care and come back out. So it takes a lot of planning to get the right resource and wherever possible to try and support that young person to go back to the placement they've come out of. Because again, the secure placement is an additional placement, which again adds to the profile of um, trauma for the young person. Oh, sorry, you're going. I was just going to say, I think there's also, um, I know at the, in, the, in the previous session there was a discussion about children moving at the age of 18. So children who've maybe been insecure then having almost a um, enforced transition to move into a young vendors institution, even if they have a very short period of time left where, whereby um, they could remain in secure care. And I think that highlights some more of the kind of legislative barriers and some of the challenges um, to ensuring that we really take a needs and developmentally led approach to ensuring we can provide care for these children in the best possible facilities for to meet their needs. Uh, and for those children, uh, just one further question, can we just, for those children who do or young, young people who do who make the transition. Is there any um, work being done on collating what, what they have said is the difference between secure care and young offenders institutions? So we have done a, done a piece of work whereby we worked with children who had experience, or who are currently in young offenders institution, who had previous, uh, some of those children had previous experience of secure. Um, and we detailed this in our report, um, which was entitled Just a Wee Boy Not Cut Out for Prison, um, which was what young, one of the young people told us was that he had seen a young person who had been remanded to custody and to him and to some of his peers, it was very evident that he was just a wee boy not cut out for prison prison. Um, in that time, what young people, so these were young people who were able to reflect back on their experiences of being in secure care. Um, and what they were, what they, what they told us was that in secure care, they felt what was particularly beneficial was the relationships that they had with staff. They um, felt that they were able to have much easier access to family contact um, and much more beneficial access to family contact when they were in secure care than when they were in custody. They felt that their educational opportunities in secure care were, they felt they were better than when they were in custody. And they felt that secure care prepared them much more for their return to the community than custody did. Now, what I should add to the caveat is, was that was very small numbers of children. But I think it's very important that we hear from those children We've also done some work with young people um, captured in our Secure Care Voices report, whereby young people who had previously been insecure or young people who are currently insecure were able to reflect back on their experiences. And as much as many of those young people said there were things they would like to be different, what many of them said was that Secure Care was the right choice for them at that point in time, was, a po was able to provide them with positive help and support. And some of those young people were able to say that Secure Care had changed or saved their lives. And likewise, in our Just a Wee Boy study, some of the young people were able to say to us that um, custody had prevented more serious harm coming to them or someone else because they, they were able to say they needed to be removed from the community at that point in time. Yeah, and I suppose that, that uh, takes us on uh, nicely in terms of when a uh, secure uh, care should be used for, but I do believe somebody else has got that um, line of questioning. Can you help me? Is that shown us? No, I think you're OK. Or is it shown us? <laughs> OK, let's see. If it's not come covered, can we come back yeah, to it then? Fine. John, your line of questioning has been covered. It's covered, thank you. Yeah. OK, Shona. Uh, we, we have touched on this, but just um, 
To, to be clear, the, um, as you're probably aware, the HMIPS report um, talked about uh, interagency communication and says the systemic interagency shortcomings of communication and information exchange across justice that inhibits the management and care of young people entering and leaving uh, Pullman. I, I just wanted briefly to, to hear your view on the, whether the agencies and this is not exhaustive, but the prisons, the courts, the police, NHS, third sector, whether um, they do work well together, the report would suggest not as well as they could. And most importantly, what could be done to improve that interagency communication? And that's whether it's a unplanned or planned change. Sometimes when it's unplanned, it'll be, it'll be last minute. And there might be difficulties in sharing communication. We heard that in previous evidence. But what, what in your, your view, could be done to, to improve that? Would like to take that one. Um, Karen? Um, certainly in previous experience, we've had, with really difficult outcomes, I would say, from a local authority perspective, we've tried really hard to get the information and the right information. I think some of the complexity for us historically, and that's been well recognised, is the whole population is so complex, it's difficult to pick and choose one particular young person with need because it's reflective of the need of the entire population. And I think certainly in my experience we've had some examples where we've been very clear, and obviously there's a social worker at court who can also be very clear um, that that where young people have self-reported that they feel OK, that's overridden some of the information that would be available to the contrary. But to be fair, by way of the report, I think that's recognised. And everybody concerned is committed to doing the best for young people, but sometimes I think that communication has got lost. There are certainly reports available um, for us in localities, for young people going into secure and young people going into custody. They are the, you, you know, they, they are the highest focus for us. So it, it shouldn't be difficult to improve that communication and set up systems where we're able to share as far as possible some of the concerns and needs of those young people. I think this does lead into, um, so I think there are, are many occasions where agencies do work extremely well together. Um, I think there are real challenges about consistency and consistency of, of joint working um, can be very challenging. I think in terms of the whole system approach, again, DIF32 local authorities do that slightly differently, so there can be some, some challenges around about consistency with that. There are very clear processes already in place for information sharing. Um, clearly, that were evidence could be could be improved but there are there are many processes and structures in place to enable that so for example um, in terms of children um, entering into custody for example there is clear guidance on what information should be shared when it should be shared and arrangements for an initial custody review to be held for those children within very short time scales to ensure that the team around that child are coming together for the purpose of information sharing discussing need and risk discussing support and ensuring continuities of supports. I think what was reflected in the in the um, um, review report was that um, setting some sort of minimum expectations of what information should be shared may well be beneficial. But there's also something about monitoring and accountability within that as well, and really identifying where breakdowns are happening so that we're identifying them in a timely manner to enable then them to be addressed. So we're not ending up in the circumstances where um, people are, are being asked to provide care for children without information about need and risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I finally ask you about, um, first of all, remand. Um, I think you mentioned it particularly, Deborah, and the fact that there's a real lack of uptake for education and work. Um, it's not clear if it's um, just education. But also, uh, in remand, um, in terms of the isolation and then the increase in suicides, could you comment on that? 
think we could could we were could only really echo what was in the mental health review report that there are obviously significant challenges for children on remand. So if we talk about children on remand in custody, there's obviously significant challenges about um, the uh, you know uptake, as was mentioned earlier, the availability and, and being able to access those services, which can then be a contributor to isolation. Um, when we talk about remand in general, I suppose there is um, obviously some um, differences there in terms of whether that young person will, for a period of remand, be in secure care or will be in custody. And at times there's legislative and financial imperatives that can factor into that decision-making process, as opposed to that, that decision always being based on the needs and what is in the best interests of that child, which can prove, prove challenging. Yeah. And finally, perhaps the whole um, panel could comment. Bernardo, as I noticed you, you comment on the uncertainty of one-year funding uh, relationships and the impact that has, which I know is an issue throughout the board. Absolutely. And that returns to my previous point about the importance of long-term trusting relationships and the restorative uh, impact of that and the sort of healing impact of that for young people who've experienced trauma and that being an absolutely key element of those services and sometimes against our best um, wishes and intentions short-term funding can make that difficult staff have lives to lead and if they don't know if they're going to have a job next month then sometimes they need to go and look for another one and that one small thing can be very very impactful for the young people that they've been working with over a long period of time and also for that member of staff who who doesn't want to do that who wants to continue with those relationships and that way of working so that's absolutely a challenge. It's, it's a challenge across third sector services, but it, it's particularly written large here. Okay. And anyone else like to comment, Karen? We've been doing lots of work in Glasgow to try and shift that um, relationship so that we're trying to release, release funding that's our money to spend over much longer periods of time so that we can get that sustainability. And in this context and in much broader context, we are really clear that third sector colleagues sometimes are in a better position to form those kind of relationships than statutory agencies. So we need to think about how we can fund that and how so in a Glasgow context, we've been quite successful in some of the high cost out of city placements and the high cost of those bringing those young people back into the city and spending the money and thinking about how we would invest. So we are about investing in an intensive service to avoid young people coming in. And that's about giving the funding to third sector partners and thinking about that over a five year period to ensure that sustainability so that we can guarantee relationships over time and build up those quality services. Okay, and anything to add Deborah? No, i would just really be echoing what has already been said. Yeah. Can I thank all the witnesses for, for their evidence? Um, this has been a really worthwhile service and um, the committee will be looking in depth at um, the evidence you presented today. Thank you for attending. Um, before we conclude the public part of the meeting, I, I note the comments in the media reporting that the Chief Executive of the Scottish Police Authority has resigned. Um, should these reports be confirmed, it is disappointing that the committee was not informed. Given this, if the committee agrees, I'll write to the Chair of SPA to seek more information. Do I have members' agreement? Yes. Thank you for that. That concludes the public part of our meeting. The next meeting of the committee will be on the 18th of June when we'll consider two draft reports. Now close this public session of the meeting.